Chantal, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarita Verma, and I am the President, Vice Chancellor, Dean, and CEO of NASM University, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine University, now known as NASM University. So welcome, it's six o'clock, and we're going to get started, and we have a fairly substantial program for you today. It is part of the President's Lecture Series, uh, NASM became NASM University last year in April. It's Canada's first uh, and only independent uh, medical university. We have a fantastic record at the residency match, which is when uh, medical students in their last year of medical school apply to go into the residency programs of their choice. And the last uh, two years, we've had 100% success but many questions still arise and, in fact, occur as a result of um, the ongoing mystery that surrounds the match. And although efforts are made in learner affairs and student affairs and undergraduate programs by CARMS to spread the information, it still feels like it's never enough. So tonight we have a substantial program for you. Uh, you can go ahead with the first slide, um, which is to go over a few housekeeping matters, Chantal. And uh, that is, first of all, to let you know that the meeting is being recorded and streamed live on YouTube at NASM TV. It does mean that I cannot actually see the people or the uh, chat. And so at the end, when we have the Q&As, we will have someone monitoring the chat so they can let us know, and it's Alex Poling. You will be muted for the duration of the session to ensure that we don't have, you know, all those noisy echoes that occur when people unmute. And please submit your questions in the chat to the co-host, whose name is Alex Poling. Uh, Q&A is actually not her full name, but it is her uh, handle for this evening. For best practices, you can do what I'm doing right now, which I actually have the slides on the left side of my screen, but I also have on the right side what I'm seeing. And on the far right, it is a side-by-side -side mode on Zoom so that you can actually see uh, some of the pictures of those people who have their cameras on. And of course, um, you can also uh, use other modes but if you're using the best practices for Zoom, uh, things should look uh, apparent to you and you should be able to see speakers. Some people have slides and some people will not be using slides. They will be speaking personally to you. And so bear with us as we have about a 10 second delay between handing over the uh, remote access from our central control over to the speakers. So tonight we have a lineup of guest speakers, as well as, of course, we're going to lead off with the uh, undergraduate medical students who led this uh, initiative. But I'm pleased to say that uh, John Gallinger, who's the CEO of CARMS, is here. He will be speaking a little differently than what he presents at all the undergraduate uh, uh, programs, um, but I hope that he'll be able to provide you uh, with um, some um, insights into how to be successful. We also have three people who've been successful, Dr. Kaylin Purdy, Dr. Pierre Plamondon, and Dr. Cheyenne Fournier. I'm going to let them tell you about themselves because it's less interesting if I read their bios and they can actually introduce themselves quite well as we get to them. 
And of course, we're going to have Dr. Victoria Turnbull, who I hope will arrive. She did have another uh, a commitment, but we're hoping she will arrive in time because she's going to talk about what happens when you uh, go unmatched. So next slide, please. <clears throat> we're going to open, of course, with our territory acknowledgement. And at Nazem University, we're fortunate to be across all of Northern Ontario. Um, and we do recommend that the Pan Northern, we recognize that the Pan Northern campus is in the homelands of First Nations and Métis people. For us, because we're in two campuses in Sudbury and Thunder Bay, those are uh, on the territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, specifically Atikamishing and Wanapate First Nations, and in Thunder Bay and Fort William First Nation. But, you know, wherever you are, and there are a lot of you now uh, that have come on board, um, the magic number was 31. So I'm happy to say that we've met that number. But I think that uh, wherever you are in the spirit of reconciliation and making reconciliation a practice, I hope that you will reflect on where you are, whose lands they are, and that we are visitors and settlers on this land, and that you should practice reconciliation by listening, learning, and fostering a culture of mutual respect and trust. And I want to acknowledge that, you know, even very recently, yesterday, there were 170 suspicious um, findings at St. Mary's Residential School in an area where we have learners in Kenora and Fort Francis. And we are, you know, aware that this is an ongoing issue. So it's not just paying lip service to reconciliation, but really living and breathing reconciliation. With that said, <clears throat> tonight is an annual event. Um, this is supported by myself since 2020, and it's run by our MD students. They pick the topic. Uh, we hold it virtually because in the past we've had, uh, you know, close to 100 people attend. Uh, our first topic was on actually mental illness and fighting stigma when you're having mental challenges, and it was in the height of the pandemic. The second topic was about racism in medicine and how what is the role of the medical school in addressing equity, diversity, inclusivity. Last year, we had a really exciting time with speakers about planetary health and environmental accountability in medicine and medical education. So these have been great events, and I hope tonight will be just as exciting. The objectives tonight are to provide medical students, although there are other people attending as well, with an overview of the residency match to discuss the challenges with career choice from a student, resident, and program director perspective. And at the end, we hope to describe the supports um, because I uh, want to mention that we have two special people here, uh, Jason Schack, who's the Assistant Dean of Learner Affairs and the Director of Learner Support Services at Nazem University, Dr. Sherry Manjo, uh, who will talk about the supports that are available here at Nazem University for students during the career choice and match process. So tonight, excitingly, uh, we hope that we will be able to um, cover the topic of choosing wisely, demystifying the CARMS match, the residency match. Um, we will have um, Jenna and Hallie will speak, then Dr. Uh, Mr. Gallinger, and then on to our panelists, uh, Dr. Plamondon, Dr. Purdy, Dr. Fournier, Dr. Turnbull, and then hand it over at the end to Dr. Schack and Dr. Mangeau. We have a time available for Q&A and commentary. We don't have to go till nine o'clock. So <clears throat> we set aside a lot of time, but we certainly wanna be sure we can cover all of these topics. So of course, without further ado, I want to thank the Nazem University Student uh, Council representatives, Rachel Peet, Jenna Simpson, Hallie Prescott, and Melissa Lacasse for helping to organize this event, and it is my pleasure to hand it over to Hallie Prescott and Jenna Simpson. Over to you, ladies. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, we are just here to um, talk a little bit about the student perspective and why this uh, topic is so important to us. 
Um, and we're really excited to, to hear from all of the panelists. Both Hallie and myself are third year students on the West Campus and currently located in Sioux Lookout for our clerkship year. So CARMS is just starting to get on our mind and we have a lot of questions that go along with it. So uh, Hallie's gonna start off with, with some, of, uh, some of those thoughts that go along with it. So when thinking about the topic for this year, um, CARMS and that entire process came up, we felt like it was something that um, was definitely well suited to this sort of a session. Um, while it can often seem very far away, the thought of residency um, throughout your medical education, it's also a topic that you spend quite a lot of time thinking about. Um, and it can cause a lot of stress during that time. For some people, I think this process is something that comes to mind even before you might um, be admitted to medical school. Um, and while you're thinking about that and your residency options, you're probably also spending some time wondering, you know, what is the CARM system? How does that work? How can I make myself a competitive applicant? And really what is going on that leads to the ultimate match process and the match day as well. Um, again, things like the decisions and timelines that you have to make can kind of sneak up on you um, and can feel a bit abrupt. It seems like it's a big decision. So again, can contribute to that anxiety. And generally, um, there is a lot of benefit to, you know, thinking about this process, um, getting information, hearing from people who've been through that, um, because it helps you engage in that process and have it be generally a much better experience. So hopefully we can do some of that tonight. Pass over to Jenna. Uh, in terms of kind of like some of the specific anxieties that students feel about CARMS, I'm sure um, Hallie and I aren't alone in these and, and we sent out kind of a survey to NASA med students. Um, and some of the things that we heard is um, it can be really tough managing your personal academic and future professional goals in a single decision. Often when we think about applying to the CARMS match, we're thinking about um, what kind of specialty, what kind of future career we want, but also um, where we're going to be relocating to um, and the environment that goes along with it, which comes along with um, a lot of personal goals, especially if people have um, a partner or family who might be relocating with them. Um, that ties a lot of people's futures into a single decision. Um, the other part is a lot of programs are unknown to us, and this is, um, I would say, especially true um, in the past few years, Our the fourth years um, who are headed or who are in the midst of the CARMS match at the moment, um, haven't had uh, the opportunity to, to visit many of the other programs formally. Um, and so there can always be some anxieties and some current concerns about expectations that might not be explicitly stated um, in the CARMS match. Are there kind of hidden agendas or hidden curriculums that schools are looking for, for how you've engaged with their programs that you may not be able to meet because you may not know about them. Um, I know is definitely a concern that we hear a lot. The other one is how do we know if the choice is right? Again, it's a big decision. It's wrapped up in your in your future goals, um, but it can feel right in the moment. And what happens if uh, you regret it later on? And so I think um, it'll be great to hear from some people who have gone through that process and what kind of their thoughts are afterwards. Um, a big anxi anxiety for students is always going unmatched. What does that process look like? Um, so we're very lucky to have um, some firsthand experience from Victoria here um, tonight as she's able to join us to talk about what that process looks like, who's available for supports, um, and how to kind of manage through that process so that if it should happen, um, what, what your options look like. Um, and then a big question is, will we be adequately prepared? I think it's easy to um, work work really hard in medical school and it doesn't necessarily prepare you for all of the things that go on in CARMS. And so there can be definitely um, some personal uh, worries about how to best set yourself up for the match um, without maybe even knowing everything that it entails. Um, so we're both really excited to introduce tonight's um, panel who will hopefully be able to, to talk us through some of these um, anxieties and worries um, and, and make that a little bit less scary. Uh, so without further ado, it's our pleasure to uh, be able to introduce Mr. John Gallinger uh, to talk to us about, uh, about the, the organization of CARMS and the match itself. So welcome, John, and thank you so much for being here. 
Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, you're very kind. And uh, I want to thank uh, you for the invitation to the to present as well as Dr. Verma. And uh, you'll have to excuse me for just a second here because I'm just trying to find where we find out here how to move this thing forward. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thanks for that uh, for your for your uh, generosity for a second there while I get my uh, my my keys where they belong. So uh, thanks again for the uh, for the invitation. Thanks again for the introduction. Uh, John Gallinger uh, uh, is my name, and I've been with CARMS for eight years. In June, the organization has been around for a lot longer than that, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, I am supported and a part of a team of about forty some people. Um, a lot of uh, developers who work on the platform and uh, folks in communication, client services, very prominent. So just a, a full team of people who are here for your success. And I cannot stress that enough. Their job is to make your job as easy as it possibly can be. Uh, that does not mean that the decisions are easy because the decisions are really are at the crux of things. But in terms of getting information, in terms of uh, how to how to navigate the process, uh, that team is there for you. So you can count on that. And you'll hear lots more about that in uh, in uh, school visits, what we call school visits, which is when our client services team actually either either uh, attends your university or has a virtual event where they go through significant detail about how the process works uh everything from the application to where, where to find different information so you, you will never be alone in this Oops, again apologize because i'm uh, there we go i'm gonna just do this okay so uh what is the karma's match well let's let's start really at, at a high level and at a high level what it is is a way for uh, applicants to decide where they want to apply and ultimately where they want to train for their residency training and programs uh to decide uh how they how who they wish to train and a big part of all of that is the sharing of information uh, programs share information through program descriptions. They share information uh, in a variety of ways uh, on their own websites as well as on the CARMS platform. And applicants, of course, share information through their through their application and through the interview process. So there's all kinds of information going back and forth uh, for people to decide uh, where it is that they want to uh, you know, spend the next uh, two to two to five years or even longer, and then for programs as to which uh, residents they want to train. And the match at its very essence is a uh, quota, which is simply the number of positions available at a for a given program. The rank order lists, which are completed by both the applicant and the program, very simply in preference order, starting with number one being the most preferred choice for an applicant to be the program they'd like to attend, or a program uh, would be the applicant that uh, that they uh, most prefer, and then the algorithm, which optimizes those decisions. That's uh, those are the those are the ingredients for for the for the match. Of course, there's a ton of things that happen, uh, you know, from the start to the uh, to that to that match outcome, and we'll talk more about those things. So uh, a bit of history, CARMS has been around, I mentioned, for quite a while, but not forever, uh, established in 1970, and that was a result of uh, medical students and uh, faculty coming together to, to, to really address some issues that had been longstanding in the process that were seen as very unhealthy, unsafe, uh, problematic in many, many ways. And the result of that was to agree on a system that would be used to manage the uh, the application selection and matching of uh, of learners into residency programs and the and one of the uh, uh, fundamental elements of that is CARMS the organization which uh, which was determined to be really, really very importantly independent of any particular uh, other organization so that we have no direct stake or conflict uh, with any individual outcomes and I will say that uh, the evolution of the system over the last, uh, well, 52 years now has been uh, a very much a partnership of many collaborators around how to make the system better. And lots of things have changed in medical education over that time. And what is very um, obvious to me uh, as an observer before eight years ago and now is that uh, that the resilience of the system, uh, for example, pandemic emerges, all of a sudden we have to do things virtually. Uh, really, the system uh, uh, adopted and adapted very quickly. So that's that is a 
an indicator to me that uh, that the system is very robust and all the participants uh, really work hard at uh, making sure that things work out for for the uh, for the better of the whole. And I mentioned, uh, you know, the the creation of the match process and CARMS as an organization, you know, was 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 uh, succeeded or preceded by uh, an experience that was not, uh, uh, in many ways, you know, healthy or safe uh, or efficient in in many ways. Uh, so among other things, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty about, you know, exactly what options were available. Uh, not knowing uh, where the which programs existed, not not sure how any positions were were uh, were available. So the uncertainty about exactly what information was necessary to make decisions was uh, was certainly an issue. Uh, the offers that did come in from programs to applicants often came uh, at different times. Sometimes uh, applicants would get uh, many, many offers, uh, and then they might choose to not respond to those until, until uh, you know, considerable period of time, which meant that others were waiting. And there was a, something called an exploding offer, which simply meant that uh, an applicant received an offer and they had until uh, a, uh, a particular time frame to uh, to accept it, or it would disappear. So three o'clock tomorrow, uh, that offer uh, is is taken off the table, and uh, so that was called an exploding offer. You know, put put a lot of pressure on people, especially when you're dealing with multiple offers. Informal channel channels were really the norm, as opposed to the uh, as opposed to the to the exception. Uh, so lots of Things happening around decision making and uh, in information flow that uh, that were not not the way it is today, which is totally transparent. Everybody has access to the same information. The platform is designed to be a, a place of information exchange, and uh, in in some cases, a pressure to misrepresent a preference so that an offer would be forthcoming. Uh, and that, of course, that that in in, in of itself is now a, a part of what we call a match violation. So you'll hear a bit more about that. So the value of the match, just to recap, uh, a level play playing field, uh, trying to eliminate the chaos as much as possible, making sure all options are available. Uh, true preferences are best, so it is safe to indicate your true preference. Rank order lists are not seen by anybody else but the applicant and CARMS. Uh, and that, that is a, a probably the most sacrosanct rule that we have <clears throat> as an organization, that nobody's rank order list is available to any other participant in the match. Uh, and from an algorithm perspective, very technical, uh, it's, a, it's what we call a guaranteed stable match. In other words, there is no other match uh, set of match outcomes that will be preferred by the participants. And I just will speak to a little bit about uh, the other kind of information that's available. And there's talk about uncertainty. There was a, a couple of years ago, uh, CARMS actually declared war on applicant uncertainty <clears throat> because we we knew that that was uh, uh, the, the the fundamental source of anxiety uh, for many <clears throat> for many applicants was uncertainty. I'm not sure how the process worked, not sure where information was, not sure what the status was of their application. So we do our very best to eliminate uncertainty. And if you ever, when you do get into the process, if you ever feeling unclear about something, uncertain about something, and you can't find the information, you please please reach out. Uh, we have a help center that has 900 articles, had 41,000 views. Uh, this last application period, so all kinds of information there for you. <clears throat> this is a high level view of, of what the match process looks like. So the initial stage, you know, beginning in May, ending in around September, uh, faculties and uh, ministries are, are, are making their plans, making their decisions around, uh, around eligibility, around the number of positions available. Uh, programs begin to uh, create and publish their program descriptions. Then we go into the application period where applicants will actually review those program descriptions, gather all the material that they need for their applications with the support of their, their student affairs and undergraduate uh, uh, you know, teams. And then they will decide which programs they want to apply to and do so. And then we are into the file review process where programs take all those files that came to them like, like any other employer, like any other employer. And there was a a debate at uh, at CCME back in April is this is the residency match a, a, an employment uh, process or is it an academic process and it was a pretty lively debate around all that but in any event uh, for programs uh, they do review the files as 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 would any employer reviewing um, the, uh, the the applicant the applicants and they decide who they want to interview 
applicants then uh, decide which interviews they want to attend. They attend them, uh, and then they then rank order lists are submitted to CARMS. We uh, we process the algorithm, and that uh, that creates the the match results that are revealed on match day. And the timing here is a little bit different because this is actually a a bit of a pre pandemic uh, uh, overall timeline. So this year the uh, the second iteration is is in April. Uh, second iteration is in May. The so first iteration is in is in April. So uh, it, it's a little bit uh, deferred than what you see here. But this is essentially the flow that you can expect. And just a quick summary, faculties and ministries set match set uh, policy, quote, and eligibility. The individual faculties and programs uh, set their criteria, their selection process. Uh, we uh, do our, our very best uh, to ensure that the process is fair, transparent, clear, no mysteries. Mysteries are not good, and we hope that demystification is something that happens when we have our visits uh, with the various schools and when we are there answering the phone or answering e emails uh, from people who are just looking to navigate the process. So again, that's that's our job. Applicants and programs provide their rank order list, uh, which, uh, which ultimately with the, al the algorithm determine the match outcome. Um, and in terms of CARMS as an organization, uh, I mentioned uh, we were created as a result of collaboration and uh, amongst uh, a, a number of organizations, learners and faculty. Uh, there are other organizations involved as well. And that that combination of organizations are now what are called the CARMS members. <clears throat> and you'll see on the right hand side the list of the members. They're all volunteers. They are, they are typically nominated by uh, one of those member organizations, and then they become part of the CARMS board, uh, which uh, I am very grateful to say uh, bring unique perspectives from not only their organizations, but their experiences. Uh, we are uh, we we are a a, a, a policy uh, enabling organization. So we don't set policy, we don't make decisions. Uh, in the context of the of the match process, but what we do do is make sure that things work fairly and work the way they're supposed to. Uh, and the CARMS board provides a voice for all those all those uh, folks that have a have a strong stake in a healthy uh, healthy and functioning match process. So just uh, turning quickly to the match algorithm itself. Um, it it is uh, it is math. Uh, it is uh, it is something that many of you will probably know. This uh, is that the algorithm that we use now was one of the one of the uh, uh, reasons why a fellow by the name of Al Roth won the Nobel Prize in economics here a number of years ago. So the algorithm is uh, has been uh, uh, you know tested and uh, and and improved, and it now uh, it allows for couples. Uh, to uh, to participate uh, as a couple and uh, and try to find out what that that optimum choice is for them as a uh, as a couple. Uh, the the algorithm itself, as I mentioned earlier, takes the rank order lists. Uh, it takes the available quota, and it generates best case match results based on firstly the applicant ranking preferences, uh, and as I as it says here at the very bottom, it prioritizes prioritizes applicants' choices. And what that means very simply is, for an example, if a, if an applicant uh, uh, applied to three programs uh, and ranked those programs, in fact, uh, Mr. or Ms. Smith uh, here, uh, program A, program B, bro, program C, even if program, uh, even if they all ranked uh, Dr. Smith uh, number one on their list, that doctor would go to program A because that's a function of their first choice in their rank order list. So that plays itself out in much more complicated ways. On on CARMS.ca website, there's a whole section uh, devoted to how how does it work. Uh, it's about the algorithm and different scenarios. Uh, if you're ever interested in it, uh, I I would encourage you to not get too deep into it. You have all what kinds of other things to do uh, if you're not actually in the current process now. So I would uh, I suggest you not uh, dig into it too much. But when the time comes uh, and you want that information, it's there. It's there for you. 
a timeline, and it was mentioned earlier that uh, it, it, it can seem abrupt, and I'm quite sure that's the case uh, because people have lots of lo medical students uh, of, of any of any of us likely have more of different things on the go than uh, than than uh, than the great majority of the of the, of the population. Certainly, certainly for me, uh, there is a timeline, however, and the timeline uh, does indicate uh, based on the sequence of events, which we looked at uh, a few few slides ago. And it does give milestones, which are more, more about, you know, really, if you're, if things are on track, here's when certain things should be done, but there are also deadlines. And deadlines are relatively few. Uh, however, they are, they are, uh, uh, they are in stone. Uh, and one of them is the application deadline. So, uh, uh, noon, I believe it was last Tuesday, was the application deadline for the 2023 match cycle. So these are folks that will be attending uh, residency uh, July 1st of 2023. And so that's a deadline. Uh, the other thing that's a deadline is the rank order list uh, is a deadline. So if uh, if you happen to miss that deadline, then that is, a, that is a very unfortunate thing. And by the way, we do our very best with reminders, emails, even phone calls, uh, if we see that somebody who we think is is participating and they just simply haven't submitted the information that we thought they would, uh, you know, they will hear from us. Uh, and sometimes the undergraduate will hear from us if we're really having trouble, uh, you know, uh, tracking somebody down because we just we don't want anybody to be to to miss something that uh, that is really critical. The timelines are created uh, by CARMS, uh, you know, at least options are, and then uh, a group called the Agency Resident Matching Committee reviews those timelines and chooses the one that's optimized uh, for all the various interests sometimes which conflict a little bit uh and those but those that armc is includes learners and faculty so those perspectives are always there so whatever timeline is uh is fine is landed on does certainly reflect the perspectives not always i would say you know, in in uh, in in full full disclosure, not everybody is 100% happy. But that's probably true for any decisions like that, where lots of folks have a have a, a, a they're working on timelines and so on. So ultimately, AFMC approves the timeline, and and what you see uh, published by CARMS is a result of that process. There is a contract, uh, and both applicants and faculties have contracts with rights and responsibilities. The applicant contract uh, outlines uh, your responsibilities as well as your rights, including around data uh, and including around the rank order list, including around what happens uh, when a match occurs. Uh, there certainly is an expectation of professional, ethical and responsible conduct. And there is a match violations policy that outlines uh, what those expectations are, as well as the consequences uh, should those uh, should those expectations not be met. One of the key things about the applicant contract, and also the faculty contract for that matter, because they are really in many ways mirror image of uh, mirror Im images of each other, is that the match that is ultimately determined through the combination of the applicant rank order list and the program rank order list, whatever that match is, is a binding offer. Binding, not it's not even an offer. It's a binding uh, outcome. Uh, and one of the match violations uh, is if uh, an applicant or a program uh, should fail to uphold their responsibility to e either offer or attend uh, the, the program. And that is, I, in my eight years, I've never seen it uh, from, a, from a Canadian graduate. Uh, so it's uh, it po folks understand and respect. And I think that's an indicator of the care that is put into the decision making process because there are lots of decisions, uh, you know, lots of folks out there to help with those decisions, uh, but ultimately the decisions are yours uh, and that and the consequence of those decisions, of course, are, are what the contract, uh, what the contract calls out. Uh, a little bit about uh, about finances. Um, CARMS is an organization. We are a not-for-profit uh, fee-for-service uh, organization. Our our fees are uh, based on cost recovery uh, and and break even. And break even includes the need for 
uh, uh, periodic upgrades of technology and other kinds of things to keep the engine running. Uh, but all the fees are are intended to be a, a cost recovery. Nobody's getting any profit out of all this. Uh, you know, again, it's not for profit. The uh, the fees are what we call activity based. So we've done quite a lot of research uh, in terms of you know where do the demand on resources come from uh, from a commerce perspective, you know, applicants, faculties, and so the fees are 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 determined based on that on those activity analysis. Uh, it's it's really trying to strike the balance, sustainability uh, for the services and for CARMS as an organization, uh, service, uh, making sure that the applicants and faculty receive the service that they expect uh, and are able to reach us when they when they need to and have their questions asked and that the platform and the processes work as a uh, as they are intended and that it's fair and equitable. All the user groups uh, have equal access to to what they need. Um, we like to think that we provide uh, exceptional service and value while ensuring that sustainability. And uh, part of that value uh, has been that we have reduced our fees uh, uh, each of the last five years by 2%, so a 10% cumulative reduction, which is our commitment. Uh, we know that it's not, not, e not easy being a medical student uh, in terms of uh, the financial obligations, but also for the faculty uh, that, uh, you know, dollars are tight. And uh, so whatever we can do to make sure that uh, what we need as an organization to provide the services uh, uh, is, um, is, is, again, value for money. This is a quick little snapshot of, uh, of just the comparative uh, uh, fees that are out there for a typical typical student. So on the right-hand side, you see exams. I just give you a bit of context with the left-hand side. This is more about application and matching. So OMSAS is the Ontario, uh, Ontario application uh, uh, process. The um, upper, upper left in, uh, are the NRMP, which is National Regi National um, uh, residency matching program, which is our counterpart in the States, but they're really only part of a counterpart because uh, the other part of the counterpart is ERAS, which uh, they manage the application piece. So CARMS manages the whole end-to-end -end cycle, uh, application and match. I would say that those A, they're US dollars, and B, there's a, a bit of an economy of scale uh, in the US where the applicant pool is 10 times what it is in uh, in, in Canada, which uh, allows for a little bit of efficiency. And then uh, you see the elective portal and CARMS, uh, CARMS fees. So I'm gonna move on to some data. So that's a, a, a high level view of of how the process works, uh, what we do, what you can expect. Again, there'll be all kinds of information available to you uh, in the school visits and uh, and uh, whenever you decide to actually dig into this. So, so uh, my my intention here is to give you that again that overview. And part of the overview I'd like to share with you is some is some data, which I, I hope provides some context around the kinds of things that we look at uh, as well as as well as you know some of your uh you know colleagues in uh, in previous cohorts uh, they they uh, rely on to help them with some of their decision making so the first thing i'll say about data is uh, around stewardship and <clears throat> carms as a as a steward both financially and uh, and with data is uh, very very much top of mind in fact i mentioned the board and our and our uh, the, the folks who are nominated by the members i can tell you that that stewardship is uh, is always top of mind with that group and you never have never are expected uh, uh, or asked to share data without your consent uh, the purpose of the data will be made clear to you and you'll have an uh, an opportunity to indicate uh, you know with the, with your consent uh, before sharing any data we we provide all kinds of different data. Right hand side gives you some examples of, of of those things, and folks typically use them to you know see about trends, but also for their own individual decision making. Uh, you know where where are the uh, you know where are the opportunities, and uh, you know where is there uh, uh, the the heaviest competition. All programs are competitive. Uh, every, all programs have lots and lots of applications, but there are some some programs and disciplines that have more positions available versus the number of applicants. So those so that kind of information can be helpful, but ultimately my uh, people, I think there was there was mentioned earlier about about ad, advice or ideas or you know for success. Uh, there are lots of folks out there who are going to give you uh, you know ideas for success around your decision making and the uh, in, in your choices around application and uh, and and ranking and so on. My advice, and this actually circles back to the to the contract is, 
make sure your eyes are wide open. Uh, because if you uh, do rank a program in that rank order list, you could match to that program. Uh, and that's uh, that's a matter of fact. So uh, again, eyes wide open is my, my advice. Uh, draw on your resources. Uh, and around the data, you you very much help determine what we what we produce. Uh, back in the day, which I hope we return to return to very soon, is uh, the in person CARMS forum. The CARMS forum was when I got a chance to go up and share uh, a bunch of data around the previous match cycle. Uh, we would often have uh, questions from uh, from uh, from learners about uh, you know have we considered uh, you know certain kind of data or this kind of analysis, and I can tell you that is. Uh, has determined uh, in many ways our direction from a data point of view. I'm just doing a little time check here. Uh, so I think I have another 12 minutes. So I think we're okay. So starting off with a with an overview here of match trends, both nationally and for NASM, uh, NASM University. And just to orient you, uh, so on the left hand side, that uh, um, that axis uh, shows the number of applicants, uh, and then the, uh, the the bars, the columns, the the big bars are the national uh, picture. The uh, the the smaller, just because it's uh, it's one university, is NASM, and you'll see that over time there's a a fairly uh, a fairly typical kind of ratio of uh, of applicants to matching uh, to first choice disciplines. So the burgundy are the applicants in the match, the blue are those that matched, the green are those who matched a first choice discipline, and that's that applies for both national and NASM. And uh, you'll notice, and, uh, and Dr. Verma mentioned earlier that NASM has a very good track record around uh, around the, the residency match. And the last three years, there were there were no unmatched applicants. And this is a this is the first iteration. Uh, and in fact, uh, so so you know that is a that is a, a great indicator of of all the possibilities and all of the all of the the, the previous success that uh, certainly uh, NASM can uh, can point to and say uh, has gone very very well. And by the way, this presentation was made available uh, there. You know, you can go to carms.ca whenever you're ready to dig into data. Carms.ca has lots and lots of data for you to uh, for you to consider. This is the couples match rates. I mentioned we have uh, we have a the algorithm can handle couples and what a couple what a couple uh, rank order list looks like. Uh, very simply, as two people who decide, uh, you know, when they look at their two individual outcomes, they will actually combine those outcomes and create a create a combined rank order list. And there's a, a whole methodology to it, uh, which uh, and which can lead to some fairly uh, interesting. Uh, uh, numbers of ranks, and there was one one year there was more than a thousand ranks one couple ahead because they had all kinds of options that they were considering. Uh, you can see the couple success rate is very strong, very very good. Uh, so if you're interested in doing that, that's an option for you. Uh, this is another piece of information we uh, we we look to, and that's the average number of program applications. So the annual number last year was twenty twenty four point six nationally, and uh, and NASM nineteen point eight. And uh, we'll come back to that in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, you can see there's been a bit of an upward trajectory of, of, of this, uh, although NASM, interestingly, uh, was following the same trajectory as nationally and then had a bit of a peak in 2019, but now has uh, has come down. And uh, I'm sure there are lots of factors going on there, uh, including, you know, comfort in, and confidence in, in, in where to apply and so on again. But there's all kinds of factors that go into this. Um, so. After the application, of course, then uh, there are interview offers. And here uh, is uh, data on number of applicants who were offered at least one interview. Burgundy is NASM, uh, the blue is national. So you can see, although the, the, the scale here makes it look like there's a bigger gap than it really is, it's all uh, even nationally, it's all you know upwards of 99.5 and, and above. NASM for the last three years at least. Uh, and that's these are the three years we've been tracking this. Uh, so there is no data regret regrettably before this, but you can see it's a hundred percent hit rate for uh, for NAS and graduates uh, in terms of being offered at least one interview. And then uh, here are, is the percentage of applications resulting in an interview offer again uh, with NASM nationally, and you can see that NASM uh, is a, is above the average in all three of the last uh, three years, as well as 
more applications to away schools, so otherwise you know, not not the school you're attending medical school for, uh, and homeschool. And uh, the homeschool has been 100% uh, uh, every year for the last three years, and uh, and away uh, again a very strong performance there. Um, and here is uh, just a similarish view, but this is broken now uh, down now by the applicant by the the discipline cluster where the application uh, was submitted, and this is a, a very common uh, cl uh, clustering that we use uh, just to take the thirty some uh, uh, disciplines and and bring them into something that's a little easier to uh, to view from a data point of view. So you can see family medicine, uh, you know, from a home perspective, uh, and then internal medicine and non surgical and surgical disciplines all. Give you some indication of uh, of the national picture there, and then the same view for nausum. Uh, and so once again, um, homeschool. Whether it's, uh, of course, this stands to reason. Uh, we know that all all homeschool applications uh, result in interview offers uh, for nausum. So it doesn't. Uh, it makes perfect sense that that's the same for the disciplines. Now here is the number of interviews offered on average to applicants nationally and at NOSM. And you'll see a lower number for NOSM, and that's really a function of the number of applications. As we saw earlier, uh, NOSM submits fewer applications than uh, the national average. And so it stands to reason that the number of offers uh, would be uh, would be proportional to less, which, uh, which it is in this case. Uh, first choice discipline uh, success uh, uh, and 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 first choice discipline first choice disciplines uh, uh, nationally and and, uh, and for NASM are also an area of interest, predominantly because people are are keen to see you know where are learners focusing their attention uh, in terms of their their uh, their career paths. So you'll see here that. Uh, Family medicine, uh, which is the burgundy line, starts off at the top on the left-hand side. And now, uh, and this is uh, likely no surprise to you if you're following the media and any uh, lots of conversations, I suspect, at, uh, at your medical schools that uh, around, around this issue of declining interest in family medicine and, uh, and the relationship between that and the number of family physicians. So there's all kinds of interest in the media about this issue. So these are just give you some of the data. Uh, and uh, the following slide is that same data for NOSM. So you'll see the similar really kind of hierarchy, if you will, uh, starting back in 2013, where uh, the, the proportion of, of, of uh, applicants who chose family medicine as first choice of NOSM was above 60. And uh, so that's changed a bit over time. However, it, it remains at a very uh, a very substantial 47% out of all applicants now are, are, are continuing to choose uh, family medicine as a first choice, which, uh, uh, you know, given the, the mandate and the focus of, uh, of NASM University, and uh, anytime I hear uh, Dr. Verma speak and others, uh, you know, that, uh, that focus is loud and clear. Uh, here's a, a breakdown of top discipline choices, a bit more detail uh, with some of the uh, some of the ups and downs here. You'll see family medicine uh, down by two and a half over the last five years, and you'll see some of the ones that that uh, uh, increased and some of the ones that, de well, that uh, the decrease and some that stayed the same. And similar picture for uh, for nausea. Uh, again, no surprise that family medicine. Uh, has uh, has really really jumped up uh, for for nausea. and if we take it back as we saw earlier, this goes, was up to sixty some percent. And uh, again, same kind of uh, uh, ups and downs in different disciplines that uh, you know you, you would you would see nationally. Here is again uh, the first choice discipline uh, success rate. So this this means that for an applicant, if they chose uh, ophthalmology as their first choice. That they match to that that, that first choice, and this uh, regardless of which discipline uh, was first choice, uh, this uh, this metric uh, indicates the success rate for uh, for those first choice uh, disciplines. And you can see again, NASM very strong with their uh, with their outcomes here, uh, upwards of ninety eight percent at the start, and back and again in twenty seventeen, and now uh, really uh, up again. That not ninety three number uh, is a is a very solid number, indicating that. Folks are uh, in many ways, you know, getting what they're looking for, at least from a discipline perspective. Uh, here's a, a snapshot of unmatched. We talked about unmatched a bit earlier, and we're going to hear from uh, from Dr. Turnbull in a, in, a, in a little bit. 
uh, around her experience. Uh, so here's that uh, that same national versus NASM view. The blue line is national. The burgundy line is NASM. There were each of 2017 and 2018, NASM had one unmatched uh, uh, applicant uh, in each of those two years. And other than those years, uh, it's been 100% match after the second iteration. Uh, and now this is a, a fairly busy slide, so we won't get into it too much. But again, when you see the data, uh, when you have a, have a look at the presentation, uh, you'll be able to see you know, some of where this all fits. And uh, by and large, uh, regardless of what discipline uh, uh, NASM applicants are, are applying to and choosing as first choice, you know, they are, uh, 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 the term uh, I sometimes use is punching above their weight uh, in, in terms of the, from, uh, as compared to the national average. And uh, similar, just uh, further on down the discipline list. And uh, I mentioned, so we talked about first uh, choice discipline. Now we're in the top three program choices. Of course, that's a combination of discipline and location and pretty closely tracking. I can tell you that the, uh, the, the, the significant number of sites uh, for family medicine programs does factor into this. Uh, so it may be that somebody is, is successful at matching to their program choice, which is discipline and faculty. So family medicine at NASM or pediatrics at Dalhousie, whatever that is, but they might be multi-site. So you, so that doesn't, that actually factors into the notion of top three program choices. And here's a, a slide with a, a bit of the picture of the movement. So mobility is a big feature of the uh, of the match process. And I mentioned this is a, you saw in one of the earlier slides, this is the Canadian context. One of the principles that we have is mobility and uh, applicants are able to apply to wherever and whichever uh, discipline and, uh, and faculty they, they choose to. And you can see the, uh, the outcomes of that in terms of matching to their home school, matching within the province and matching other province. And here's uh, at least for last year, where the NASM uh, NASM graduates and matched uh, matched applicants, uh, you know, started their residency in July first of last year. And finally, uh, this uh, phrase is heard very often in CARMS. What matters to you matters to us. Uh, so as clients, as learners, as uh, as colleagues, if I if I'm able to say that. Uh, your success uh, is is what we're all about, and uh, it's it's prim primarily from our perspective, it's process success. Uh, your your decisions and the decisions of others, of course, will determine those outcomes. Uh, however, we want you to go through this process with as little possible anxiety, no mystery, uh, knowing where you can access information and access uh, support to navigate. Uh, we're here for you. So uh, that's with that, I will I will hand it back over to Dr. Verma and uh, thank you once again. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Um, and really, that's a lot of data. And thank you for making it clear that it was going to be available on the NASM web uh, on the CARMS website. Sorry, but it's there is a lot of data on the CARMS website, actually, and I think people who wonder it's such a mystery, if they really wanted to spend their time looking at all of that stuff, it would be very helpful to them. Our plan was to have a break, but I'm hoping that my colleagues will agree that we could forge on because I'd hate to lose momentum. We have about 15 to 20 people on YouTube as well, but I'm hoping that if Pierre, you're here, we could probably just uh, carry on because I think it'll be helpful to uh, maybe get to the Q&As later on. People will have lots of questions for you, John, um, but that was a really fantastic presentation. So thank you so much. So I think rather than going to a music break, um, Ali and Chantal, I'd like to take this opportunity to carry on and have our panelists describe their journey. So we might be a little bit ahead of the time. And I'm also wondering if somebody could contact Victoria because she hasn't shown up yet. And I'm wondering if we could just check in and make sure that she's going to be arriving on time because we will be a bit early. So if somebody could email her and find out, that would be great. So um, we asked three people who are NASM MD grads and also have uh, two of them have stayed to do their residency, but have been very successful with the match. And I'm going to use this opportunity to introduce Dr. Pierre Plamondon. Um, and then he's going to introduce Dr. Kaylin Purdy. And then she's going to introduce Dr. Cheyenne Fournier. 
Uh, Doctors Purdy and Fournier are not using slides, so I think there may not be a slight delay, but as Pierre, you request access right now, uh, we could go over to your slides. And Dr. Plamondal is a rural family physician in campus casing. He's going to tell you a little bit about himself, so I'm not going to steal too much of his thunder. Um, but could you request access and we could go on to Pierre's presentation. Welcome, Pierre. And thank you for sharing your journey with us. Awesome. I, I have requested access. I'm just looking for uh, the slide buttons and, uh, and I think this is working now. So um, I've, I've put together a few slides to just guide uh, the conversation I wanted to have and the experience I wanted to share. Uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Verma, for inviting me to, to this talk. Uh, in large, I'm gonna be talking about uh, my experience kind of choosing uh, a career in medicine and, and, and which, uh, which type of career in medicine I wanted to move into. Uh, and also a little bit about going through the match, which is going to be a smaller portion. So a little bit about myself. I'm uh, uh, Pierre Plamondon. I'm uh, now a rural family medicine physician, and I'm practicing out of campus casing. Uh, my uh, clinical uh, areas of interest are uh, care of the elderly, palliative care. Uh, I do some addictions medicine. Uh, emergency and uh, hospital medicine in a rural setting is, uh, is also there. Uh, and I still have that passion for our uh, rural and remote healthcare, along with uh, Francophone Indigenous healthcare, which uh, actually is, is one of the reasons why I'm here in Capus Casing. Um, one, one of the big uh, drivers to my decision to um, uh, practice medicine the way I wanted was my uh, prior career before medicine. And, and this just is a, a highlight of uh, before medicine, I was working in uh, industrial settings, uh, both mines and pipelines, uh, uh, previously moving uh, through careers in, in this setting. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's important to highlight because I've had a multitude of career transitions uh, uh, and, and a little bit of a roadmap that lays out the foundation for, uh, for my interests. Um, and interestingly enough, um, as I've said, I've moved from uh, working in, in the pipeline industry, uh, mostly in, in Ontario, but across all of Ontario, uh, and then uh, moving back uh, closer to my, uh, my home in Northern Ontario into mining uh, sector. Um, both uh, as technicians, operators, and, and progressing into uh, roles of training and development and uh, human resources. Um, and that last role in human resources also led to uh, an exposure to physician recruitment in our small rural town. Uh, and, uh, and the lack of physicians we were able to attract, which uh, eventually led me to an interest in medical school as uh, the uh, original mine I was working at was transitioning and closing. Uh, so this is a little bit of a background. And, uh, and it's interesting because at first when I started medical school, I really thought that I would have a big part in occupational medicine. I had been exposed to it in, uh, uh, in my career up to this point, And I wanted to have uh, um, it as a big uh, portion of, of what I would do. Uh, but uh, it was early exposure in medical school, and I have here a picture of, uh, um, uh, it's the hospice in Sudbury, and it was an early exposure there, and uh, interestingly enough, this was a, a, at a time where I didn't know a whole lot about medicine, I didn't even know uh, medications that were used to treat pain in medicine, uh, but uh, this exposure uh, actually uh, help me kind of decide the path I want, I want to go into. Uh, and part of it was because I had some experiences uh, talking uh, specifically with patients and seeing the encounters between patients and, and skilled clinicians to actually uh, uh, help them through, through the trajectory of, uh, of palliation. Uh, and the big portion was a combination of the, the clinical aspects and also uh, the, the, uh, the 
patient guidance and, and the interactions with families that actually was a big part of it. Uh, and it actually led me to uh, explore other aspects of, of medicine. And a lot of them started to focus uh, a lot on uh, interacting a lot with uh, patients and families. Uh, so for me, it led into uh, the role of, of the physician in, in geriatric care and palliative uh, medicine that was a big portion. Uh, but this slide is kind of, uh, it guides me to the conversation that uh, our, our previous life exposures, our exposures in medical school, and also um, our, our lives, our partners, our families actually probably guide us to where we're going to want to practice and where we're going to want to train. Uh, and for me, the location of my family and where I wanted to train in residency was a huge draw. And I knew that I, I wanted to be close to home, close to Northern Ontario. Uh, the other aspect was uh, the, the needs in our community were also a big factor and, and care of the elderly was a portion that uh, uh, needed uh, a little bit more attention in our uh, rural Northern corridor. Um, so it, it, it really led me to seek out exposure to these areas. Um, and the other aspect uh, was um, as I had changed many careers and, uh, and jobs uh, uh, before medicine and being having uh, a wide exposure to things, uh, I also had an inkling that I would probably want to evolve my scope of practice and change things along the way. Um, and, and then I had to decide between picking a generalist or a specialist uh, type of pathway. Uh, and that's where um, the electives in, uh, in second, third, and fourth year uh, through NOSM really helped out. Um, as you can see, I've just laid out a map. For me, location was a huge thing, and you can sense it by where I went for my electives uh, in, that, uh, in that medical school. I really stayed in Northeastern Ontario. Uh, but I explored very various aspects of the medicine I was in, interested in. And a lot of it had to do with geriatrics and, and palliative care because of the early exposure I spoke of. Um, so I, I went and sought these out. Um, although Sudbury is highlighted as just one dot on here, many of these electives were actually central to Sudbury because they were easier to get in these specialties of geriatrics, uh, both inpatient, outpatient, psychiatry, and, and the oncology oncology care that was there at the Northeast Cancer Center uh, was also parts of the exposure. Uh, so I sought out these experiences, aiming to uh, make a, a, a choice not to travel across Canada for some of these exposures, because I knew um, that uh, I was going to be uh, aiming to come back to Northern Ontario uh, for residency, or, or at least that's what I wanted. Um, so uh, the, the big aspect, though, that was a, a, a little bit of a, a tug of war for me was uh, trying to balance whether I, I wanted a specialist uh, in geriatrics and possibly uh, adding some palliative care to this, uh, or if I wanted to have a more uh, generalist uh, approach. Uh, and uh, one of the big drivers that uh, led me to the to the decision I, I had was really moving towards uh, the community needs. Uh, every time I, I had a focus at the community level, and I was reaching back to some uh, some of my colleagues now, but uh, practicing physicians in the area, uh, there was always some needs to cover our emergency department, our hospitalist uh, coverage needs. Uh, there's been a huge draw for rural obstetrics to continue. Uh, and, and to help our, our general surgeons and OR assists and all this stuff. Uh, it really led towards um, me uh, aiming towards a, a career in family medicine that could incorporate all these things, <clears throat> but also look at uh, incorporating aspects of uh, specialization. And one of them that I came <clears throat> to be exposed to even later on in the training was some uh, addictions medicine, and I've laid it out on here because it was also a local need. Um, 
So in at the end of the day, there was a, a, a huge pull towards a generalist practice. Uh, and, and I've always tried to struggle and balance uh, how to uh, incorporate some of my interests uh, in, uh, in some of the specialties of geriatrics and, and palliative care and, and now also uh, addictions medicine uh, into this general practice. Um, so I, I had done a little bit of work uh, previously, but looked at uh, various generalist theories that look at uh, a broad scope versus a deep scope. Uh, or a combination of the two, which is uh, depicted in this uh, T-shaped form that has uh, just a, having a broad scope as a base, but also taking a deeper dive into certain areas of interest uh, that, that you can have. And, and I thought that this fit in well uh, with uh, the needs uh, that I was going to see in, in, in the community where I, I wanted to go and practice and eventually uh, train. So... All of that together for me led me to uh, uh, rural family medicine because I thought that I could have all of these things. And I was uh, actually coming into a setting where uh, specialists in these areas uh, are, are not around. They're, they're, they're not in these small towns. Uh, so I could develop uh, special areas of focus and interest into my generalist uh, approach. Uh, so uh, when I did uh, some research into this, I found that uh, uh, training in rural family medicine was going to give me that pathway and allow me to have those, uh, uh, to, to incorporate that into my practice. Uh, so uh, I, um, I ventured into the match uh, with this in mind, uh, having focused my time really on getting exposure to these things in in medical school to lead me to make a decision on where I wanted to apply. Uh, then heading into the match, it was, it was easy because the decision had been made for me that I was gonna apply to um, uh, NOSM in uh, Northern Ontario. And I specifically made a decision and, uh, and I was being and probably uh, questioned by some of my peers at, at the time, but I, I did personally make the decision to apply uh, to uh, the NOSM program exclusively and, and, and ranking the rural sites uh, first uh, and then sites that were closer in location to where I wanted to be uh, um, and only listing the sites where I would uh, be okay matching to and really not venturing off uh, away from that. Uh, and, uh, and then at the end of the day, having faith that um, the experience I had uh, gotten in, in uh, preparation through the uh, uh, third and fourth year electives was going to make me a competitive candidate for, for these programs uh, and, uh, and allowing the match to make uh, to, to to make that match, essentially, allowing, allowing CARMS to make that match. So uh, that was uh, my pathway, and it made it easy during the, the CARMS uh, application process for me. Uh, I was able to focus uh, on, on uh, just uh, one application, uh, a couple if you, if you uh, separate the rural application from the rest of the family medicine application uh, through NOSM. Uh, and, uh, and at that stage, uh, it also made it easy for uh, the interview process and, uh, and allowed for a little bit of a, a breathing room in fourth year for me. So I didn't have to travel uh, across the country for um, a, uh, a, a bunch of interviews. So that was uh, kind of my pathway um, to rural medicine. And I think this is the end of my slide. And at this point, I um, just have somebody take it over. And I wanted to hand uh, the baton over to uh, uh, Dr. Purdy, and I'll let her uh, introduce herself. Great. Thank you so much. It was very interesting hearing about your journey as well. Um, so, um, 
Hi everyone, um, my name is Kim Purdy and I'm very honored to be asked to speak with all of you and I'm joining you from Tree 6 territory tonight. I'm originally from rural BC and graduated from Austin News class of 2018. It was based on the West Campus. I'm currently a PGY4 um, neurology resident at the University of Alberta. I'm also simultaneously a master's student in health policy at Stanford and uh, we'll eventually be doing a combined stroke and health policy research fellowship at the University of Calgary in 2024. After that, I'm not exactly sure where I'll go from there, but uh, my passions are a bit diverse, include not only acute care and neurology, but rural specialty care and inner city care and health policy research and development. Um, but tonight I'll focus mostly on the match and making some choices. And I've now experienced a match from almost all angles. Um, in medical schools on the CFMS board as Ontario Regional Director and then Director of Education in my final year, which was in 2018, the year of the highest number of unmatched students. And that's where I first met Dr. Verma, as well as John Gallinger. I then went on to sit on the CARMS board uh, with John and then the Professional Association of Residents of Alberta board. And I'm currently the learner member on the AFMC board executive committee with Dr. Verma. So I hope tonight to offer some wisdom on things to consider when choosing your specialty and your career path. I will say that I didn't, I did, definitely did not always know that I wanted to be a neurologist. I didn't always have an interest in health policy. And I ended up here because I let opportunities and interests guide a lot of my decisions. Um, I really struggled in medical school with choosing a specialty because in reality, I just really liked medicine and I like advocating for people and patients. And in truth, most specialties fit with that. Um, I struggled really between three, between neurology and neurosurgery and family medicine. And I liked all three for different reasons. Um, I like neurology because I feel like I truly get to be a doctor. Examining patients and history taking is held so highly in neurology that's the biggest thing in your toolkit. And I still find it fascinating that I can localize where a problem is and build a differential without using anything but my words, my hands, my brain to figure out where a problem is in the nervous system and usually what it is. And neurology and neurosurgery share the fact that their diseases impact who people are as a person. The brain's the core of our being, it's who we, are, who we are and how we experience the world. This makes it a challenging specialty, especially where often all you can do is walk alongside patients and try to ease their suffering. It's also one where you can, in the very same day, make incredible saves and one that never ceases to amaze, really. Um, every day is interesting, and in truth, it's why I chose neurology. But I like neurosurgery for its skill, precision, quick thinking, fine motor tasks. But there are reasons I felt it wasn't right for me, which I will talk about. And I like fine medicine, the diversity, the longitudinal relationships, which I also get in neurology, age diversity, and that offered me a chance to return to my hometown physician. But I found myself always wanting to know the finer details of every disease. And that really became overwhelming for me when you're supposed to, to know every disease. So with that being said, I'm a big proponent of not making medical students commit to one specialty because in the end, all you should really want to be is a good doctor and having a certainty is okay. And I will tell you, it will work out. Um, when it came down to my CARMS application, uh, I actually unsubmitted all of my neurosurgery applications 20 minutes before the application deadline um, in the middle of an ER shift at the Thunder Bay Hospital by, uh, I will share this with you, faking a bathroom emergency and logging onto the CARMS website from my computer in the staff bathroom. So in the end, I only applied to neurology and family medicine because I could see myself doing either. Um, and, but as you know, Nostrum doesn't have a neurology program. So I had a bit more anxiety to the process knowing I didn't have a home program, unlike literally every other applicant to neurology in the country. I decided not to apply to neurosurgery because I was actually afraid of the type of person that I might become if I chose that specialty. Well, my interest and aptitude were fine, like procedural skills as well, were very well suited to that specialty. I want a specialty that let me be a person first and a doctor second. And I wasn't really willing to sacrifice who I was to medicine. And I was worried that that might happen if I became a neurosurgeon. I think finding a specialty where you feel like who you are as a person at your core is supported. And really knowing what your values are and how both training and practice will foster those rather than hinder those. is perhaps one of the most important parts in making a decision. I also think knowing yourself well and the type of environment that you need in order to thrive is also the most important part. Um, to consider when choosing a program or a site. Part of that environment could be proximity to family or friends or proximity to certain recreational pursuits or even types of ethnic grocery stores that are important for you. These things matter as much and I will say probably a lot, likely a lot more than what academic half days are like or where or when or where you start a longitudinal clinic or what specialty rotations a program offers. As far as like elective and trying to figure out what, what you might want to do, you do want to do enough electives and specialties to know if that specialty is right for you or not. Um, I and Australia, my electives equally between neurosurgery and neurology. In fact, I alternated weeks 
And that's how I knew that neurosurgery was ultimately not compatible with who I was, the core of my being. Um, as for applications, you generally look at your electives to see that you've spent enough time to know especially is right for you. But they also spent time elsewhere to show that you took your learning as, as a physician very seriously and that you considered other options. My electives in neurosurgery are still actually very helpful for me as a neurologist because I've seen the tumors that cause the seizures and atrophies, and I've seen anatomy up close. Every elective you do is valuable in experience and helping you choose what you like, but also just being a better physician in general. And it, like me, if you can't decide, apply to more than one thing and maybe let the match decide for you a bit, like I kind of tried to do. What I end up doing is actually ranking three neurology programs with Universal Alberta being first, and then my fine medicine programs, and then five remaining neurology programs. So I didn't actually rank all neurology or all fine medicine in a row, um, I alternated a bit. And all of that didn't really matter when it came to MASH days. I matched my first choice anyway. And in fact, I'm the second person in Austin to ever match in neurology. Um, training in a specialty that is five years is definitely a really big commitment, not only to the field, but to that location. So I'm actually about six and a half hours from my hometown, which for me is close enough that I see my family usually at least every other month and more often this summer with longer days and better roads. Um, and I actually also took a break from residency after my third year to go and do a master's in um, health policy, which is an interest I found during my time with the CFMS as a medical student and time as a student at Nelson U. And it's something that will probably forever be a lifelong non-clinical passion of mine in medicine. And interestingly, when I went back to read my residency personal letter recently, I indicated that I wanted to do a master's in health policy during residency. I didn't imagine it'd be at Stanford, but um, I've actually been able to do what I hope to accomplish in residency beyond just clinical training and studying. Taking that year off at Stanford was not only amazing because I was at Stanford, but it gave me a moment to pause and reestablish some priorities and really remember who I was as a person and where I wanted to go. You know, back in the day, I actually had a choice for medical school and, and I picked Nelson U because I come from a very rural part of Canada. I knew that no matter what field of medicine I ended up in, caring for people in rural and remote parts of the country was and still is very important to me. And I wanted to be a doctor who wasn't urban focused, so I chose a specialty. So I knew going to NASA would prepare me for that, regardless of what specialty I picked, whether it be fine medicine or something else. And going to Stanford for me was really a part of furthering that toolkit of learning how to develop health policy for equity and learn the research skills I'll need to improve specialty care access in Canada. I've also actually been able to design some of my residency training to be in smaller communities, which isn't really a standard part of my program, but have they been flexible in allowing me to do this? And I actually volunteer with a harm reduction team in Edmonton, um, in the inner city. And I have plans to establish a neurology outreach clinic in my hometown once finished training. Residency is hard, um, no matter what you choose, no matter where you go. Um, but making residency fit you rather than you fit it takes effort, but I think it's actually really important um, to making it feel like it's the right thing for you. And reflecting a bit on my time as a student at Nossum, I remember that there can be a lot of pressure to become a family doctor and perhaps even some feelings of guilt as a student when your interests lie elsewhere. I know I definitely um, had that happen to me a few times, um, but the North needs specialists too, and a good specialist is someone who understands your community and its needs. And coming from Nelson U, that's a core part of your training that you'll carry with you into residency and practice. For me, I've carried that desire to improve rural and road access to neurological care, particularly acute stroke care and policy around it. The likely value part of my life's work, and this work will benefit patients in all parts of Northern Remote and rural Canada. You can be an awesome student, you can be an awesome physician, um, and you can improve care in the North even if you don't choose my medicine. Your specialty choice is, and your career is what you make of it. So try to maybe put some of that guilt aside and try to try to channel that into ways that you're gonna use your training as a specialist to improve care in the North. Uh, I encourage all of you not only to reflect on your intellectual interests, which I think is what we often get asked, what do you like in medicine, what do your interests lie, but also who you are as a person and what makes you you. And pick a specialty, or more than one, that completes you as a person and then depletes you. And if what you're applying to isn't a common path at NOSM, and if NOSM doesn't have the program you're interested in, go for it anyway. You're a strong applicant coming from NOSM U, as um, John showed us today. And your training is unique and it's valuable and will carry you far in your career. And be open to meandering path. Sometimes decisions and opportunities take you in a direction you would never have thought possible. And I'm pretty grateful that my residency um, has been flexible in a way that lets me design it for what I want to do, which isn't really a normal path for a neurologist. Um, but uh, I don't think there is sort of normal is what people define it. So I think um, picking a residency that's, uh, and a specialty that you can kind of customize into what you want it to be is something that's really important. Um, and with that, uh, it's actually my pleasure to pass it on to Dr. Shannon Fournier. Thanks, Dr. Purdy. Very interesting to hear about your experience as well. And thanks to the team for inviting me tonight. 
Um, so my name is Shyam. I'm a Francophone PGY2 rural family medicine resident. I'm based out of Hearst. Uh, for those who don't know where that is, we're a town of about 5,000 people, about 10 hours north of Toronto. We're halfway between Nossum's East and West Campus, not very far from Dr. Clamondon, though I'm only about 100 kilometers east. Um, unlike some of my classmates, I knew I wanted rural family medicine from day one of med school. And that didn't really change throughout my journey, which might be different for some of you, but I can tell you why that was the case for me. So long story short, I've had experiences in both my personal and my professional life where rural family doctors were basically the only resource available to provide life-saving care to their patients. Before medical school, there was somebody that I know uh, who nearly passed away because they had already received all the local units of blood while the air ambulance trans or the air ambulance can land because of a storm, which is very typical. We have one right now. Um, to nearly having to assist in an emergency pericardiosynthesis on my first day in one of my rural placements, something I never even imagined uh, contemplating doing. So that made me quickly realize how rural communities depend so strongly on their local physicians. And from those experiences, I decided that was the type of care that I wanted to provide myself. In line with this, when I was a med student, I also appreciated how much more hands-on experiences you get in the small rural towns, because there's no fellow, or there's no senior resident, there may not even be a resident for that matter. And because of this, you get to be involved, you get to participate, and I think that's how you learn best. So right now in Hearst, there's only myself, and one third year medical students as the only learners, which means we get to choose the experiences we want and we're first in line to get them. I remember missing this when I was doing my block-based urban learning in fourth year. So I knew that I needed a longitudinal residency program so that I can do a bit of everything throughout the year. Even now, as a rural resident, uh, I find that when I go complete some urban blocks, that somewhat takes away from the learning experience because there's such an abundance of consultant services. So there's much more volume and there's higher acuity. So you get to see a lot, but you don't get to do as much yourself. So that was the gist of why I chose rural medicine. But as you know, there's a ton of rural programs out there. So why did I choose NASM? Honestly, it's a very tough decision. And it comes down to the fact that CARMS is a contractual obligation like John discussed earlier. I think you need to start by starting out where you want to live or where you wouldn't mind living because it's gonna be your home for a minimum of two years. Also think about what's important to you. Are you gonna have family with you or are you gonna have supports nearby? Is that something you think that you need? Or are specific academics or a particular program reputation something that's more important to you? And unfortunately, no one can answer this for you. And it all depends on what your priorities are. For myself, I had already been away from home for many years with my undergrad and with med school. So the idea of being home with my family for about six months a year was better than being home no months at all. So right now, I do all of my real family medicine blocks in Hearst. And then I travel to either Sudbury or Thunder Bay for the specialty rotations that aren't available here. So this brings me to something else we need to consider. Does the program require you to travel? And is that something you're okay with? Um, you may go back and forth many times on this. And if you only decide the day the rank order list is due, that's okay. I know that's what I did. And there may or may not have been a coin toss in falls. Um, because if you toss a coin when you're in doubt and you're disappointed with the result, then you know you should choose the other option. Um, so now I know some of you might have a lot of questions on how to best prepare for residency in family medicine because it's such a vague specialty. And again, unfortunately, there's no right answer here. But you do have the luxury of doing electives in anything you want because everything applies to family medicine in one way or another. I even did an elective in radiology. And honestly, that probably proved to be my most helpful elective so far when I work in the ER now. Um, something that I think is important to mention is I was also part of the COVID cohort. So I was the class of um, fourth year med students 
are the CARMS uh, group where COVID affected us the first. So that means, um, first of all, we were the first group where all of our um, interviews were done virtually. But most importantly, we couldn't do electives outside of our school. And in my case, because of local COVID restrictions, I couldn't do electives outside of Northwestern Ontario. So that was rather restricting. Um, I remember all of our class was super nervous about this because you can't go meet people from other programs. You can't go introduce yourself. Um, you can't get the feel of the different sites and not all specialty electives are offered at NASM. But in the end, honestly, it didn't matter because I have classmates who match to highly competitive specialties like dermatology, OB, urology, and ortho. So this points to the fact that it's all about what you learn from the experiences and how that's gonna be benefit you personally in your future career rather than the actual experiences themselves. Um, just one thing I want to mention before I finish my turn is I want to acknowledge that some of you might be feeling very stressed out by all of this information and the whole CARMS process itself. I remember being offered a bunch of different info sessions as a medical student and still not yet grasping the concept enough to be fully comfortable with what I was doing and whether I was doing it right. So what I tell people now when I see med students is honestly, just ride the wave. <laughs> a lot of us stay nervous about the whole process. You might never feel like you truly have a grasp on everything. Um, and that feeling might not really go away completely, but honestly, we all get through it. You do it one step at a time and you'll too. So in summary, if you're going to remember anything from my part of this talk, it should be, first of all, consider rural training to get the best bang for your buck. Second, consider a program on where you don't mind living because it's going to be your home for the next few years. And lastly, it's okay to be nervous about the process. You're not alone and you're going to make it through because we all did. So on this note, I'll send it back to you, Dr. Verma. Thank you, Cheyenne. Thank you, Kaylin. Thank you, Pierre. So, you know, you've had the journeys from three different people who've been able to describe how they made their choices and why they did. You know, one of the key factors that's coming out from when I listen to this and all of these things is, and, and Mr. Gallinger mentioned this early on, be true to yourself, right? The decisions are not necessarily about finding the perfect solution because, you have a life of this. And where is your life? Where is your partner? Where is your home? Where do you want to live? Because at least two years in family medicine or five or more in the specialty is a major investment into your life. And I just want to acknowledge there are a lot of people on YouTube as well. Um, and I think the biggest source of anxiety people have is, what if I fail? What happens if I go unmatched? And there is a lot of um, stigma associated with that in our society. You know, you've gone, you've been successful, you got into medical school, you finished medical school, you did well in medical school. And this might very well be the first time that you experience this kind of uh, unfortunate outcome. But it's not so bad. There are lots of supports available to you, but it is still an experience that you need to know something about. So Dr. Victoria Turnbull is, a courageous and wonderful person who actually wants to share what she went through when she went unmatched. And I'm going to let her tell you who she is, what she's doing right now, and what happened to her. Uh, so yes, well, we're getting good at changing the remote <laughs> access. So Victoria, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Verma. I really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. It's nice to meet you. Like Dr. Verma mentioned, I'm Victoria. I'm one of the residents in urologic surgery, surgery at Western University. I sit as the site chair for the PERO. So as Dr. Pretty mentioned, the PERA is our Ontario equivalent. Um, and I was the director of education and Ontario regional director for the CFMS last year. Uh, and before I did any of those things, like Dr. Verma mentioned, I was an unmatched student in the 2021 match that both Dr. Fernie and I uh, participated in. We can go forward to the next slide, please. Thank you. Am I able to do that? Um, so I just kind of, I think one of the things I was asked to talk, to speak to you about today is what it's like to go unmatched. I think we all know it is crummy. I think anybody can infer that, you know, 
as Dr. Verma was saying, you know, what if I fail is not a question that we've really encountered very often as medical students. Um, and so I want to kind of give, give you a sense of what that really feels like. So this was the email I got. Many people know, some people don't, that you can opt in to find out if you've matched the day before match day. Um, and at my school, they send out emails like this. So, you know, it's Monday, it was sunny out, it was unseasonably sunny, I was sitting in my backyard. You know, you're nervous because you know, you know, this is it. This is when you find out. But I'll, it's, at the same time, you also don't think it's going to be you. And I don't think you ever think it's going to be you. I certainly didn't. You know, I was getting some spam emails, freaking out every time my phone went off and then deleting them and be like, why are you even worried? And then this came in. And so I just want you to take a second when I think about match day and I, what I think about, you know, how it feels to go unmatched, I want you to think about what have you heard about unmatched students? When you ask, you know, how do you not be me, basically, what do people tell you? And then I want you to think about why is match day so important? And I think, you know, getting into medical school, very exciting, very important, but we don't talk about it the same way. So what is it that makes match day different? And when I thought about that question, I really realized Match day represents the moment that all those sacrifices you make, all that hard work you put in, all those dreams you've had, you know, I've wanted to be a surgeon since I was 12 years old. All of those things are supposed to come true. It's supposed to become worth it in that moment, in that day, you know, 10 years of work becomes worth it. And we put a lot of pressure on that single day to do that. And putting those things together makes it feel like absolute garbage. Not only did you not have that come true, not only to your perception, are you watching that come true for everybody else around you? But also all those things that you've been told about unmatched students rush into your brain like nothing in this world. And I have a very vivid memory of that, just having this onslaught of memories of things that people had said to me about uh, unmatched students. You know, I was told they were lazy. They don't work hard. They never bothered to show up on time. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, talking about how the match is really just about being a good person that people want to be co-residents with, which, you know, on one side is very nice if you do match. But if you don't, it makes you wonder, you know, did everybody hate me? Did nobody tell me? Um, and so it's a lot of things to reconcile with. And at the same time, you know, we are having this incredible event right now to talk about decision-making in the match process because it's a big decision and it's a hard decision to make. And for most people, it takes them, you know, most of med school before they really have any confirmation of where they want to go. That's three or four years, depending on where you go. And now you're being asked to make that decision in two weeks because the second iteration, which is the remaining spots and the remaining candidates from the first iteration happens over a period of a month, but the applications are due within two weeks of the first match day. We can keep going to the next slide, please. So in your first moments, how do, how do you feel? You feel like you've never failed and, or if you have, it's been very minor and this is suddenly very big. You feel like everybody is talking about you. And to be honest with you, you know that you are, that they are because you've probably, you know, seen some match days depending on where you are at in medical school. And you know that people are talking about those people and that is very hard. You feel like garbage. Uh, you, I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to stay in bed. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to, I wanted to eat everything. And I also had this huge decision to make. Uh, we can keep going to the next slide, please. Which kind of brings us to, I think the thing that everybody really wonders when we talk about going unmatched, because it's just this big black box. It is this big black box of failure that nobody wants to talk about. Um, and so, you know, as Dr. Purdy said, be open to a meandering path. What are your options if you go unmatched? So the second round, like we talked about, the remaining positions and the remaining candidates enter into that second round of applications. There is options for an extra year at your school and at my school to be eligible to do electives in an extra year. You had to apply in the second round. Um, and some people opt for new careers. People have become real estate agents, lawyers, done really incredible things. And I think as much as it's easy for me to say this on the side that I'm at now, I would really, as much as you can, as hard as it is, view going on match as an opportunity, an opportunity to evaluate your life and what you value. Dr. Purdy talked a lot about, you know, figuring out what program and site is right for you and finding a specialty that completes you as a person. It's very easy to forget who you are as a person in, med in medical school. And being pulled out of that actually caused me to have a lot of reflection and figure out who I was and what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Looking at the second round is daunting. It's exhausting. The positions get published at the same time that everybody else finds out where they're going. So if you find out on the Monday that you went unmatched, you have to wait until lunchtime the next day to find out what the actual spots and where they will be are. In my first year through CARMS, the only two surgical seats in the country were a vascular surgery spot at Calgary and a cardiac surgery spot at Western. I think when you're looking at this, you really have to think about, you know, what do you want to do? Where are you willing to go? Um, and how, how willing are you to compromise what you wanted? And I think when we say what you want it, what we want, 
as Dr. Purdy mentioned, I think a lot of people can like a lot of different things. And I think that's incredibly valuable. So really look at what did you like in medical school when you have to make a decision like this? Um, what things really gave you light? So for me, I came in knowing I wanted to be a surgeon. I didn't actually know I wanted to be a urologist. I thought I wanted to be a cardiac surgeon conveniently. And what, what about that? What made me make that decision? And what else could I, where else could I see those things happening for me? So I really saw those things in vascular. I saw them in cardiac as well. So I think when we look at the second round as an option, it's do you apply narrowly and go for only truly the things that you could see yourself doing and be happy doing, or do you apply broadly to everything and get yourself out of this position of being unmatched? I will tell you that being unmatched literally ends up getting matched, but it does not figuratively end. Those feelings don't go away. That feeling of inadequacy, the bounding sense of imposter syndrome that hits you, the wondering why you're there, that does not stop when you go unmatched. And I would say that match day two is a very bittersweet moment, whether you match or you don't. I have many colleagues who match to incredible specialties in the second round. They do incredible things and they really like what they do, but they do always have a sense of what if. That being said, going through you know, the second round and we'll get to it, but eventually an extra year, I had a lot of, what am I doing here? Why did I do this to myself? Um, I personally chose to apply very narrowly in the second round. I really took what I call the 3000 foot view of this process. And I wanted to say, you know, if I looked back when I was 40 years old, 50 years old in the height of my career, looking at it, enjoying it, maybe not enjoying it. How was I going to feel about that decision that I'd made? And I knew if I applied too broadly, just to get myself out of this immediate situation, I was going to be, you know, having that constant, what if that I just mentioned versus, you know, if I applied to a couple of things that I really could see myself doing and got that, I would be okay. I would be content with that. And ultimately, if I got nothing, I got an, an extra shot at what I wanted. And that would be, you know, a situation that I was quite, quite content with. I applied to those two seats. If we could hit the next arrow, please. Um, I did not get either. And the thing that I actually had the biggest challenge reconciling with was that at my school, that meant that I didn't get to graduate with everybody else. I didn't get to be a doctor. I had to stay a medical student. Uh, I did 16 weeks of electives. They split them evenly between urology and obstetrics and gynecology. Um, and I was terrified because all I had ever heard was that nobody is going to consider an unmatched grad. There is a reason they didn't think about you the first time. There's a reason they didn't take you the first time. And that's why you're here. And now they have this whole new pool of applicants and you are old and dull and they are new and shiny. And why would they take you? Uh, and I would tell you that that completely ignores how the match works. That assumes that the match is a yes or no, where they make a decision, but just like you rank, they rank. And so, you know, if you are in my, in my specialties, sometimes there are only three seats at a school. Some of the bigger programs only have three seats. If you are fourth on the list, you can miss getting matched at that school, but you still were fourth out of, you know, let's say 90 applications the first year I applied. That is really good. Um, so I think really important when you're making these decisions to reach out to feedback, for, reach out for feedback and reflect. I reached out to programs that I didn't interview with to figure out how I could get that next step. And I reached out to programs that I did interview with to figure out how how could I have turned that interview into a spot? Overwhelmingly, I was told that it's just a really unfortunate situation and I got unlucky. If I'd heard other feedback, I think it's really always important to internalize that, really think about, is this the right match for me? Is my personality happy with this? Or am I telling myself that this is something I want? Um, we can hit the next arrow, please. Thank you so much. Which brings me to a really important point. You know, people tell you a lot of different things in the second round, people who I I like to think are very well-intentioned tell you to take a five-year seat because you may have heard that some residents can transfer. Um, I want to tell you, and I think I want to echo what John said. I want to echo what the other residents who've spoken today have said, always be willing to finish what you start. Do not rank something you are uncertain about, whether that be a specialty or whether that be a location. You could end up there if you put it on your rank list. And if you are going to be very unhappy, it's not worth it. Don't forget your worth in this process. You are someone who is a person first and a doctor second. You get to be happy in this process as well. And it is okay to fall. It is more about how you come back from that. Coming back to do programs think about unmatched candidates. I did 80 times better my second time through CARMS than I did through my first time. I now had a story showing that I could overcome a challenge. I was resilient and I wanted that specialty more than anybody could imagine. Um, we can go to the next, the next arrow, please. Thanks. And then one more time, please. And anyway, thank you. Which brings me to, I think the most important point of CARMS, which is, or, or of the match, whatever you want to call it, to trust yourself and to trust your instincts. 
Um, I was terrified. Like I said, I had been told that I wasn't going to be considered. And I felt like Dr. Verma mentioned, there was a lot of stigma. People spoke to me differently. People talked to me differently. My friends talked to me differently. People had a look when I met, you know, more junior medical students that would be like, you know, how do I ask you how not to be you without asking how not to be you? Um, and at the end of the day, it comes back to doing the best that you can trusting yourself and working hard. Um, because of that, because of all that stigma, I ended up wanting to make some changes locally, the way that the Mac program is set up, that was really challenging. And so I got lucky. There was a spot on the CFMS. I ran for it. I got it. I kept saying yes to things. Don't be afraid to say yes. Uh, and now I get to be here talking to you. I've advocated for changes. I've advocated for increased match spots. And most importantly, I get to stop making this a huge, big black box that nobody is willing to talk about anymore. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Which brings me to this, when I talk about decision-making, whether you do an extra year, whether you apply to any specialty in the second round to get out of this, whether you um, go on to a different career completely. I wanna put matching into perspective. I had friends who matched in the second round. They're incredibly happy with their careers now. I have friends who matched to their absolute first choice program and location and specialty and ended up transferring out after six months because they realized it wasn't for them. Um, I think there is a lot that goes into your decision-making. I think like Dr. Purdy said, we can all be happy doing a lot of different things. And I think you really need to reflect on the choice you make, why you made it. Are there other things you could do? Um, get feedback, ask for help. Um, there were a ton of people who wanted to support me. I remember my school had this phrase that was like, find your cheerleaders. And I remember saying to them, I don't have those. If I had those, I wouldn't be here. But then when I reached out, I actually had a whole bunch of people who wanted to help me. I got text messages from different residents saying, you know, this staff member really wants to help you, but they don't want you to know that they know. So please just reach out to them. They want to help you. Um, people are always going to be behind you and find your support system, reflect on who you are. And just like Dr. Purdy said, please be open to a meandering path. When I first started this, the biggest thing that bugged me was that I wasn't going to get to graduate on time. That is a blip in my rear view mirror now that I don't think about. I've had opportunities I never would have had without this. I'm not going to say it was all golden. I'm not going to say it was lots of fun. I get the huge benefit of hindsight when I talk to you today. It was very hard. My hardest day as a resident pales in comparison to the hardest day I had as an unmatched student. Um, people, you are filled with doubt. You are filled with doubt about yourself and your abilities and whether or not you're ever going to get the thing you want when you're putting so much effort into it and, and unimaginable effort at times. Um, rotating with people who turned you down, there were still no visiting electives, as I'm sure everybody here knows when I reapplied. So I had to rotate with the same program and the same faculty members that I knew had sat on the committee that had chosen not to take me. It was very challenging, but I truly believe that those are moments that test who you are as a person and test your character. And if you can reflect on them and overcome them, it makes you a better person. It makes you a better physician in the end. I am a better resident because of the experience I went through and my program saw that and I'm very grateful to them. If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Which brings you to again, what now when you embark on an extra year, like I said, I had the opportunity to do eight weeks of electives uh, in both urology and obstetrics and gynecology for a total of 16 weeks. I did an extra degree. I was on the CFMS. I had a ton of opportunities. Be willing to say yes, be willing to try new things, be willing to self-reflect. If that self-reflection brings you to maybe this isn't for me, or maybe I'm going to try it one more time. You do have to set an endpoint. You know, you can't go for something forever. It might not be for you and that's okay. It is okay for something not to be for you. And I remember people saying this sentence to me a lot, you know, you're more than your career. And I remember thinking, I'm really not, I don't know how to tell you this but I'm really not more than my career and I love my job and I don't want to be failing at it. Um, and taking that extra year really showed me that I had really lost a lot of perspective and that I really was more than my job. But even when I'm not going unmatched is a blip that you will for one day, you will forget. And we can go on to the next slide, please. Or the next arrow. And those, thanks. Um, overall, the, my approach to the match and to anything in life is you just can't beat the person who never gives up, come back swinging. Don't let people convince you that programs aren't going to look twice at you. If you get feedback on things that you need to change, do those things. Be willing to you know, be willing to accept that you can be better. That should be true whether you match or you don't. Um, but you just can't beat that person who never gives up, who shows up every single day and shows you that they want to be there and that they're going to work hard to do that. Uh, program see that, program directors see that, residents see that. If we can hit the next arrow, please. And the last thing that helped me make my decision was my dad, who since the day I was born has always said to me, the worst thing that a person can say to you is no. Um, 
So I will give you the same advice. If you're going again at an extra year, if you're going for something scary and competitive uh, and you're scared to be me, don't be scared to be me. The worst that you can say is no, and you can come back and try again. Uh, and if it's not for you, sometimes that's okay. It's okay to learn. It's okay to fail. It's okay to fall down. It's not about the falling. It's about the coming back from it. Uh, and that is everything from me. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Victoria, Dr. Turnbull. Uh, really beautifully done. Um, you know, I was the postgrad dean at Queen's University and then at University of Toronto and probably was the grandmother of postgrad. I was also very involved in CARMS. And I did have people who decided to choose, you know, tactically a five year residency program, thinking that they would be able to get out and go into the other program of their choice because they thought the funding was available and there was some gaming involved. And of course, every year they would apply for a transfer and every year they wouldn't get it. And, you know, they were in their fifth year of residency in a high end specialty, but they were unhappy because they hated it, but they were pretty well stuck in that career. So I used to say to people, you know, if you don't want it, don't rank it. And going and mashed is not the end of the world. As you described, there are, challenges with it but you got cheerleaders and at Nazem U we have amongst many cheerleaders two terrific people uh Dr. Jason Shack who's the assistant dean of learner affairs and Dr. Sherry Monjo who's the director of learner support services and what they're going to do is briefly describe what's available to people as you're trying to make these decisions and then we will end with some questions and answers thanks so over to you Dr. Monjo Oh, well, thanks, Surya. Um, can everyone hear me? Because I, oh, I have control now. Oh, um, sorry, that's Dr. Shack, not Dr. Mojo. Or yes. her voice has deepened suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, and I can't for some reason, oh, there, oh, I see what's happening. There I am. Um, and I move to slide number two. First off, I want to say um, thanks, Dr. Verma, for the introduction. So, um, I'm suffering from a little bit of imposter syndrome, I think, sitting here for a couple of reasons. One is it's 23 years ago since I went through the CARMS process. Um, and I can say actually parts of that still stick in my mind. Um, the second part of this is, is I'm extremely humbled um, by the reflections and comments this far by the panel. Um, I, I think very insightful. I think I think it's been highlighted already. The one that probably biggest theme is is to remember who we are as people um, as we move forward in this process, and and not let the process of thinking about our future career or the process of becoming a doctor actually try to remove that from us. Um, so I think as, as stated, I'm the assistant dean of, of learner affairs, and I'll, and I'll let Sherry, um, Dr. Mojo, introduce herself in a, in a second as, as sort of the second part of this slide. And we're here to sort of bookend this by, by talking a little bit about what we do here at NAWSOM in terms of um, support around the CARMS process and sort of support through the four years of, of medicine. Um, this in, in some ways is, is maybe a big part in terms of what we do in learner support services. It's in some ways a, a small part of, of what is your process through medicine, but hopefully an important part. Um, and there will be similarities of this in many of the other schools in, in for most of the schools, what's called their student, um, student affairs department. Um, what I wanna talk about a little bit and something that's new and awesome is, is that there is actually now a curricular component to this. Um, in some ways you can sort of split these up into sort of what is, what is sort of looking at the group and then what is looking at the individual. So basically there's a four-year curriculum, um, which is still adapting and still developing. Um, which really focuses on career wellness and and sort of financial components of 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 medicine, but also also personally, what sort of financial um, components apply to each of us. And and like I said, there's more of a group focus to this, but it, it's around initially starting with sort of what is thinking reflecting on who we are, what is our professional identity, um, and then moving that sort of into you know what are options for careers, exploring different careers. Um, exploring specialties, exploring locations as part of that. Um, and, and what I'll let Dr. Mojo or Sherry talk about a little bit more is then how that actually sort of reflects in terms of what we do through learner support services, which is taking some of those concepts and taking some of that 
um, sort of group speak and, and bringing it down to you as an individual and helping to support you through some of those next steps. Thanks very much, Jason. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sherry Monjo and I'm the Director of Learner Support Services. Um, but I did have the privilege of being a Senior Learner Affairs Officer and uh, had uh, the ability to work with many, many undergrad students and help them and support and guide them through this very process. So a lot of what the students are, well, the physicians are saying this evening rings very true to me. And uh, certainly uh, am very proud of all of you for being here this evening and congratulate all of you again on going through a very you know, challenging time and, and becoming very successful physicians in your own right. So certainly uh, from a learner support services um, perspective, uh, we do provide a lot of support. And one of the things that, you know, um, some of the questions that were happening uh, in the beginning was, you know, where do we get this information? How do we get information about CARMS? So we support our um, undergraduate medical education learners through a four-year curriculum. And as part of that four-year curriculum, Learner Support Services offers many different avenues to gain the knowledge you need to move through uh, the four years and really focus on um, your journey. And a lot of you, that's what you said tonight. It's an individual journey. So we provide individual one-on-one -on -one sessions with all of our learners. We start talking about career focus very early on. We talk about what does that look like? Um, there are many scheduled meetings with learner affairs officers um, who have lots of knowledge about um, specialty medicine electives um, looking at pathways talking about the very thing that all of you have spoken about, what's important to you in the end? Is it geography? Is it family? Is it specialty? Where do you hope to land and where will you be happy? Because we know it's an individual decision and it's a decision that takes a lot of thought process. We're there to guide, support, provide you with stuff like, you know, curriculum review. Um, we do mock interviews to help support you through, you know, uh, prepping for those interviews but it really is a personal journey and we can be there to support and guide. But in the end, um, it is a decision that is ultimately made by the learner. Next slide. So this really leads us into what we consider to be that community of support. So we talk about um, all of the resources that are available to all learners um, at Nassim University. And certainly it's about that identity formation and what does that look like for all of you as, you as you're growing and learning and deciding what is it going to look like and where do you think you're gonna, and we call it, where do you think you're gonna land? Where do you think you'll end up? What will you be? And we often say, you know, what are you gonna be when you grow up? It's one of those, it's a great experience to go through. And, and it really is as much as, you know, it's, it's an exciting and scary process for all of you. It's a journey that I've lived and breathed through all of you as well. And I've lived those highs and lows with every single one of you. And there are so many resources available to all of you throughout, you know, uh, the course of your journey in medical school. Um, it's stressful, but there's lots of cheerleaders, as Victoria has said, to there to support you. And those include many folks like your family, your friends, um, you know, the student assistant program. So if you're, if you're dealing with emotions or, or you're having anxiety and you certainly want to reach out to counselors, they are there for you. There's preceptors and faculty who can support you in understanding some of the specialties. What do they look like? What does the career really look like? So there really is a huge community of support um, that is there to guide you throughout this entire journey. Thanks, Sherry. And I think just to add to that, and, and Sherry sort of echoed it in there, is, and, and I think tonight's talk actually shows this community support um, and the fact that, that most of us actually want to talk about what our path was and how it got us to where we are. And I think not, and, and, and to sort of echo to, to students in the process that everyone around them, whether it's an elective, whether it's a, a core rotation, whether it's they're walking by a physician in the hallway, that, um, that most of us, I think the majority of us at most times are actually quite willing to find some time to sit down and have a conversation about about how we got to where we are and about, about what our work life balance is, about, about what our specialty is like and actually have those conversations. So don't, don't forget that. 
Um, a couple of things just to sort of talk about some of the specifics and a little bit of this has been mentioned. Um, and some of this will vary from school to school. The dates don't, they're set by CARMS, but in terms of what happens at each school. Um, but specific is, is a pre-match day. So this year being March 21st. Um, and, and what we do here is a couple of weeks beforehand, I will send out an email to all of the students basically asking if they want to opt out from what they did with CARMS. So you can opt in and out with CARMS as to whether you want to know we provide them yet the option to opt out if they've passed the deadline when they can do that with CARMS. Um, and, and like um, Dr. Turnbull had said, and similar to her school, um, for those that go unmatched, um, then we will reach out to those, to those students the day before um, and to, to see where they're at, um, to see how they're doing with the news, and then to try to help them sort of in terms of moving forward. And that I think is very much an individual process in terms of in terms of where that ends up. I mean, basically, you know, we're willing to give them the afternoon off, the next morning off of match day, um, and then and then some time off afterwards to start what is a very busy process of of moving into the second iteration of the match if that's what the next step is, or deciding what that next what that next step is step is. But some of this is going to vary from individual to individual in terms of whether they want to take that time or not, um, and and sort of helping them navigate that. And then, of course, match day, which is 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 March twenty second. Um, at the moment, the way it is, uh, the afternoon is off, so the match comes out at noon. Um, and and I've heard various stories, and remember very much myself way back when trying to find a computer somewhere to sit in front of. Um, and at that time, an internet connection was very much a challenge, being in northeastern Ontario on an elective at the time. Um, and and to find out where you had matched, but then also finding out who else was around you in terms of what happens after that match. Who do I want to talk to? Who do I want to tell? Um, I can tell you at the moment I'm working on trying to actually make this the whole day off, um, as, as most would say uh, in the morning, um, probably our heads in the cloud and where we're not quite focused on what we're doing um, clinically, wherever that may be anyways. Um, and then, of course, um, all of us in learner support services um, are around to, to, talk about, um, to talk about both if you go unmatched, but also to talk about if you go matched and, and what next and, and, what you're, and what you're feeling. And, and so that leads to the next step, which, and this has been talked about, I think, sort of what are our match day emotions and, and really what are the emotions around this whole process? Um, and it was mentioned, and, and it's, it's very common that the medical students almost even prior to starting medicine, now that they've sort of taken that next step and gotten into medical school, it's, it's the thought of what next, what happens uh, in terms of how do I get into my next, you know, how do I go through that next hoop? How do I, how do I decide a specialty? What is CARMS like? How do I pick that residency spot? Um, and I think I think part of this whole process and, and the big theme that everyone has said is really coming back to who we are as a person um, and, and what are our priorities in life and not losing that focus. And I think that's the, the whole point of this slide is to is to is to come back to um, acknowledging what the emotions that we're having, right? And and I think to be to be honest with ourselves. Um, as we move forward through this process and also then to seek those around us in terms of helping us with how we're feeling if we're sort of struggling with some of those emotions and that sort of stuff. Um, that's okay because this can be a stressful process and and there can be times in medicine where it kind of tries to pull us down and it's harder to cope with some of these things. So I just turning to those people that are around you and that will vary depending on who you are and what your supports are but to know that that we are out there to help with that with that process. Yeah and thanks very much for that Jason. So certainly um, as a former learner affairs officer, I did uh, spend lots of time with learners who were very excited that they had matched to the, you know, the, the specialty that they had wanted since they were 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. Unfortunately, there was a lot of other emotions that were attached for some learners. So some learners matched, but they didn't match to the school they wanted to be at, or they didn't match to the specialty they wanted to be at. And that can be very difficult for learners because um, for them, the emotion of being matched seems to be um, taken away from them because they haven't really gained what they hoped they were going to gain. So even going matched doesn't necessarily bring all of those joyous emotions. It can bring heartache. It can bring sadness. It can bring fear. Where am I going to go? I don't have my, you know, my, my best friend is going to the school that I thought I was going to go to. And now I'm on the other side of the country alone. How am I going to cope without my support system? How did I not match to the specialty I was hoping to match to? 
a lot of learners will rank one, two, three specialties. And, you know, we often talk about that ranking and what does that look like and the importance of, you know, deciding for yourself how to rank what's best for you. But as um, some things do go wrong where students don't get the specialty they were hoping to get, that's very distressful for them. How can they not be a surgeon? How could they not be an ophthalmologist? How could they not do exactly what they wanted to do? There are so many emotions that go with that. It's a lot for them to process. And in fact, I've worked with learners who it's been three, four weeks. They're still getting prepared to move to go to residency and they still haven't accepted the fact that how could they not have matched to the specialty they really wanted to match to? It's a really difficult thing to do reflect upon and process on. And I think it's really important to remember, and we've all said it here tonight, everybody is human. No matter what emotion you're experiencing, it's okay to have those emotions. And it's okay to share those emotions and go through the process of reflecting on them. The best part about all of this is even when I've had students, the very few at NASA U who have gone unmatched and went through second iteration, when they match to their um, specialty, which was not their first choice, they have been extremely satisfied in the career that they got in second iteration. And I think that that's the key is there's always going to be happiness in what you're looking for. So I think that, you know, just really um, recognizing that you're not the only one, that there are many learners who, who go through the same emotions that you do but there's always going to be a lot of support for all learners, no matter what happens, whether you match, whether you match, but not to your specialty, whether you go through second iteration, whether you have to do a fifth year, the journey is there, but the supports are there as well. Thank you. Next slide. I think, and I think Sherry sort of hit on on the, the part of going unmatched. And really, I can't, I don't think either one of us can take the um, the words out of Dr. Turnbull's mouth, who really went over all of all of this. Um, and to know, I think, as we talked about that, you know, take time to deal with the emotions that, yes, the spots come out on noon of match day when everyone else finds out. Um, and then the process um, is, is quick. Um, and we will go sort of out of our way at the schools to try to assist with that, but also to assist with time um, and making time within schedules um, to, to be able to assist you with, you know, working on CVs again, um, you know, reaching out for letters, um, you know, helping with mailing things, you know, all that sort of stuff um, and, and going from there. And then the other thing which was mentioned, which is around, you know, if, if you, you know, go on depending and schools differ a little bit about the requirements for year five, um, but but depending depending on where you're at, and if you go unmatched after the second the second iteration is is looking at okay what next and reflecting how do I how do I move forward with this and, and back to that same thing who am I as a person and 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 where do I go from there? Thank you, Jason Sherry. You're right on time. Um, so does Nelson University offer a five year fifth year? Jason, yes, we do. what happens in that fifth year? So it's it's really very much, I think, learner um, driven and Dr. I mean, Dr. Turner is a little bit better at answering this. Now, I mean, for either one of us, we've never had anyone that's had to do this at Nelson University. So um, it's, it exists there, but um, it hasn't had to be used. But realistically, I think the requirements are similar that we've had, that we've heard from from around this table is that typically learners have to participate in the second iteration of the match. Um, and then it allows, if they're in the, in the fifth year, it can be a combination of, of various things, including um, elective time, clinical time, um, possibilities of research time, um, and, then, and then participating in CARMS again. And I'm going to go around and ask questions, but if people do have questions or they have comments, you can send them in the chat to Alex Poling, uh, who is Alex polling Q&A, and then I will ask Alex if there's any questions. But my next question actually is for Mr. Gallinger, which is, so what is it that happens um, 
when you apply to a place and you get it, but then you regret the match decision? What are the logistics of what you do? You've, we've talked about what happens at the school, but do you have to you have to sign a contract? Do you have to, you know, or have you already signed a contract when you made your applications? Um, and what if you decide that you don't want to go there? Is there any any remedy available to you? Thanks, uh, thanks, Rita. So, as you as you mentioned, uh, there is a contract. So applicants uh, applicants are obligated to uh, to accept the match, just as programs are. However. Um, it does happen where an applicant will approach a program, depending on the circumstances, uh, and uh, and talk about, you know, the, the situation and, uh, you know, what they're faced with. And uh, if the program agrees to release them from that match obligation, then they are able to go back and participate in the subsequent year's uh, first iteration. <clears throat> so that's that's the circumstance that can that can occur. Uh, it does happen. Uh, however, beyond that, uh, you know, really, it is it is an obligation. And I mentioned earlier, there's a match violation policy. And if uh, a, a program or an applicant uh, you know, does not honor doesn't honor that match, then there's a process that they would uh, they would go through. But but it can happen that they can be released by the program. Um, and I think that people probably need to know that if they had, let's say, a physical illness or a prevailing family situation, you know, uh, parent who's suddenly acutely ill that they can defer their match is that correct john again uh in consultation with the program uh and my experience is programs are very <clears throat> very uh, uh willing and interested in having the conversation uh about that nobody wants to have a, a resident who is having a a difficult time and uh, is in a situation that they're uh, they're not comfortable with uh, so that the first the first uh step would be to engage with the program uh, just a couple more questions now for our panelists from uh, current resident and graduated residents. You know, Pierre, you talked about location playing a big role for you, and so did Kaylin. You wanted to be a certain number of uh, bikeable distances, I think, Kaylin, from where your hometown was. Kaylin's a big biker. Um, but I think the, the question is location versus specialty. You're sitting there and making your rank order list and you're trying to decide, but you really want, let's say, neurology or rural family medicine. Um, Pierre, what do you think? What's your thought about location versus specialty? And Kaylin, over to you after that. Uh, I think it's a it, it's always a, a tug and pull between uh, these things and you have to reflect and, uh, internally into uh, who you are and, and how that location is influenced for you. Uh, I know for me, it was the, the biggest the driving factor, even though I had uh, significant interest in, in other aspects of, of medicine, and I would have loved to maybe have pursued some uh, more specialization. Uh, there was a, a pull back to, uh, to the location, uh, and that pull to the location was also pulled back to a, a type of scope of practice. Uh, which I'm very, very happy with. Uh, but uh, it's always uh, that looking at that uh, uh, internally at yourself and being true to, to yourself and, and, and what, um, what your interests are. Kaylin, what are your thoughts? Location versus yeah. specialty. Yeah, so I actually ranked based on location. Um, so I ranked Western Canadian neurology programs. And then when I applied to Fly Medicine, I actually applied to Western Canadian Fly Medicine programs. So my hometown is in British Columbia. And um, my, my thinking was if I couldn't be a neurologist, I would very rather be a family doctor in my hometown and be near my hometown for that than spend five years plus fellowship in some part really far away where I didn't actually ever want to practice. Um, so I didn't actually rank based on specialty. I ranked neurology as my first choice specialty. But my top five ranking choices were a mixture of fine medicine and neurology and all mostly based in Western Canada. So um, and I think for me, like if I had matched uh, elsewhere in Canada, that would have been a big problem in residency, just given that I had some sort of family emergencies that occurred during my residency time that would have been really difficult to manage had I um, been elsewhere in the country. And so I was very thankful that, that I had chosen to do that with my rank order list. Um, Obviously, I matched my first choice as well, which obviously is a nice thing, but I would have been happy to match, say, fine medicine in Calgary or at UBC or something like that, too, because then I could have just been a fine doctor, not just a fine doctor, but been a family doctor in my hometown instead. And that I still think if that today someone told me I had to switch to that, I'd be like, OK, that's fine. So, yeah. 
Um, a little bit of interest, uh, well, actually a lot of interest, although because of COVID, electives, visiting electives and electives away from your home school have been pretty well shut down. We're opening them up again. Um, and this may not be easy for like Cheyenne to answer because you weren't allowed to go on electives, but are there thoughts from the three of you or uh, John, uh, Jason and Sherry? So I think I'll open it up, but I, I think I'll just start with uh, with uh, Jason and Sherry. What's the advice on electives? Like people figure they they would like to do all their electives and their specialty of choice, but in fact, we don't encourage that, right? Um, and and how important are electives to getting your career choice, Jason? Yeah, I, and I'll, I give the answer that I usually give to the students, albeit I, I often say that I'm, I'm, I probably sound more and more like your parents and, and you don't really realize that maybe what is is the truth happens until later down the road. But, um, and I don't remember, I mean, I guess I remember my thoughts as a, as a, as a student and, and really trying to use electives about a sort of a combination of things. A little bit was career exploration. Some of it was location exploration. Um, and some of it was actually just picking up on things that I hadn't quite had a full grasp on. Um, and so hence a, a neurosurgery um, elective for a couple of weeks, um, which, uh, and I'm not a neurosurgeon, but it, but it sort of helped with you know, neurology and that sort of stuff. And a dentistry elective actually of all things, um, having gone into um, uh, my previous life, 11 years in a, a small rural community doing generalist practice since some time up north. Um, and, and so it's really a combination of all of those and trying to sort of switch the focus from it being all about getting into a residency position um, and about really exploring, going back to who you are as a person yourself and, and exploring that professional identity. Um, and, and I think it varies a little bit sometimes the advice we give depending on which type of program you're going into. It's a little bit different with some of the high highly competitive programs, but I think generally speaking, it still, it still applies that general advice. Um, the other interesting thing of what we learned in the last number of years without having um, electives is, is, is at least it helps to support that when we say electives aren't the whole picture. Um, they don't make who you are and they don't, they don't get you into that residency program. Um, and, and, and just, it's, it's about presenting who you are as a person and, and what your experience is and what your interest is. Um, and it will really show what you can do moving forward, I think, to those programs. So that's that sort of general advice. Um, sometimes I think that's a little hard to swallow when you're, when you're in the, in the throes of trying to apply to these positions and trying to, and trying to, you know, show who you are. Um, but I think in the end, actually, actually, that's, the advice that we give and the advice that to try to follow. Does anyone else have a comment? Any of the uh, residents or practicing physicians? John, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I'd only just add that there. This is another area where we have data. Uh, so uh, you know, go to carms.ca. It'll show you all kinds of information and over the course of time. Uh, you know what has been the elective pattern in terms of uh, elective in the discipline of of, of choice, uh, elective in outside the discipline, and uh, you know whether it was at the home, at the school or not. So there's you'll see quite a range. There's no clustering of this particular profile is going to get this particular outcome. It just it just isn't the case. But the data will be I, I suspect will be very helpful. I'm like uh, Jason, you know, I went through the match, which was pre carms actually, so a couple of decades ago. And uh, at that time, you could send in perfumed CVs and a photograph of yourself and, you know, send flowers to the secretary who arranged your interview afterwards. Are there protocols uh, that one should avoid? I mean, now it's a common CV template. Is that right? Uh, um, again, John, maybe you could answer this, but, you know, are there things that one should or should not do? And anybody else can comment. Uh, I have had people drop me letters, you know, as an interviewer to thank me personally. Um, I can just jump in. I think one of the things that we suggest from a learner support services is that you have a very clean, clear, concise uh, CV. And so 
Um, we do provide our learners with a template and the template is really just a guide. It's not about, you don't need to use the template, but it's a guide. So oftentimes when a learner has their CV and the first thing they bring to us, I think it's about 14 pages long. And we're like, mm, that's a little bit long and I don't think they're gonna read it all. So let's review, let's see what's really critical and let's take a look at it. So, I mean, the highlights for us are the top part is the education, your um clinical electives, your clinical experience. And then we look at, you know, the research, the publications, again, depending on the specialty that you're going into. So by the time they get to, and we recommend no more than five pages, because if you can imagine how many CVs um, that the programs are reviewing, they typically don't get to the fifth page to see that, as Kaylin would say, she's an avid bicyclist. Um, but really the template is there for, for you to, to really guide you and it's about, you know, little things that we do to help support you. And that is making sure the font is exactly the same, that the spacing looks nice. It looks clean and it's easy to read. So that's just a little bit from Learner Support Services. Any other comments? Should I be accepting those bottles of scotch that are dropped off at my door? Hey, I would. Oh, you go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Oh, Mill. Go for it. Um, oh, please call me Victoria. Um, I, uh, I think this goes hand in hand a little bit with the elective conversation we were having earlier and what do you do in the absence of them. And I think to me, an elective represents wanting to get to know a program, if nothing else, visiting electives in particular. And I think that one extra thing that I have seen people do in virtual programs that I did myself quite a bit my second year through was to get to know programs by reaching out to them, to speak with their program director, to speak with residents at those programs. You know, it works both ways. It shows that you have an interest in the program, but it also really helps you get to know the program because you are kind of going in blind a little bit without visiting electives. The other thing I always tell people to do is to put that into their personal statements, the same way that you used to write, you know, when I was here at this program, I saw this and I liked this now, right. You know, when I spoke to this person, I could tell that I would do well in this program because I really get along with them. I think I would work well in this environment. These are the things, like, these are, I think it's less about, you know, sucking up as some people like to think of it and more about showing you know, I really do want to be here I've made this effort to get to know you and this is how I'm showing you that if I could just jump in uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, this is a lot about information exchange uh, and programs are looking for two things are you qualified and are you interested uh, and both those things are important so qualifications, whether it's academically or research, whatever whatever else is without the interest and without the desire uh, is really going to come through loud and clear. So, you know, whatever you do uh, in, in, uh, in those areas that will be will be helpful. Alex, are there any questions in the chat or from the YouTube? Yes, there is. Um, our first question is uh, for John Gallinger. Um, when you apply to a residency program, do the schools you apply to see the other schools and or disciplines you are also applying to? I.e., if I apply to U Ottawa IM, would they also see that I applied to Queen's IM? They will not. That is your personal information. Uh, if you choose to share that, that's up to you. Uh, if they ask you, it's uh, in fact there are questions that uh, that in the interview process that are that are considered to be out of bounds, and that kind of thing is one of them. It, they certainly cannot ask you about your ranking. That is actually a violation. Uh, the application is a little bit of a different. Oftentimes, people will will share that, but uh, you, they they will not hear it from us. Uh, and uh, if they hear it from you, then that's uh, that's your choice. Fantastic. And uh, our second question. Um, firstly, thanks very much for this informative session. Um, my question is, uh, does Nassim U offer opportunities for clinical observerships for international medical graduates? Um, I have I have previewed the website uh, and I have not found any information about this. Jason, do you want to take that or do you want me to? I, I can let you take it through. I think the answer is, is no, that we don't, um, at least in the, in the undergrad world. Um, yeah, at this point, our capacity issues are that we have uh, 
you know, a strong commitment to the medical students and residents who are training uh, currently in our medical school, because we're a distributed program with a preceptor based program. And we also have a very significant limitation on housing. So, you know, we're distributed around 90 communities. That said, I mean, people can do observerships, uh, but it's really space limited. And as a result, um, then of course, our next priority are students and residents training in Canada and in Ontario medical schools, because, you know, the evidence shows that, you know, 20% of them that come to do, at least residents come to do electives will come back to Northern Ontario. And the goal is of course, to get Northern Ontario uh, the most robust workforce. Um, international students or international medical graduates can come into the match. And currently in Ontario, it's in the second round of the match. So they're not eligible for the first round of the match in Ontario. They may be in other provinces, but it varies province to province. And in the second round, currently, the decision is still pending as to whether they will be in a separate stream or they will be uh, added to the Canadian and international medical stream. Um, it may very well be blended again, but that's not yet been formally decided. Thanks, Alex. You're very welcome. That's it for questions for now. Okay, well, I think uh, wrapping up, unless anybody has any other comments, um, I want to, first of all, thank everybody for attending. And those of you on YouTube, I hope that you enjoyed it. And we'll send it out uh, broadly to the uh, particularly uh, undergraduate medical education programs, certainly in uh, at Nauseam University. Uh, our speakers, you guys were awesome. How would they know that we had only just started to run through the slides a half an hour before we started the presentation? And everybody uh, was so informative. Uh, John Gallinger, as always, you know, you are the heart blood of all of the work that happens where career choice and the future of careers of physicians is so important. And you hold that in your institution, high quality excellence. You know, I'm a huge supporter of CARMS and very happy to see that it continues to thrive. Uh, certainly for Pierre, Cheyenne and Kaylin, you are uh, amazing, great ambassadors for uh, Nazem University. Uh, Alex, before I go on, do you have another hand up? Did you have some, another question? I do, we've got a late question. Um, is there anything you recommend for pre-clerk students to prepare for CARMS? Example, doing research, doing electives. Cheyenne? Oh, oh Kaylin? I would actually just comment because I, I did this because I was actually, we, we do neurology in, I think, still in their first year at NOSM. So I, I knew I liked it from that, from that time. Um, and I um, was having trouble shadowing any neurologists um, in Thunder Bay at the time. It's actually how I ended up in Edmonton was a neurologist willing to take me for the summer in my, between my first and second year to shadow uh, here at U of A and actually the research project with them over the summer as well. And so I think like, if you're like curious about something and maybe don't have access to it, or you're just curious about it um, as a first or second year student, um, that doing a research project in that area can be helpful to be like, nope, I don't like this, or yes, I do. Or just like shadowing, someone that, you know, I shadow an ICU doctor sometimes in the evening, like during the week for a few hours to see if I like that. Um, those things were like helpful to do just to say like, is this for me or not? Would I want to do elective in this one day? Um, and also it's helpful just to sort of explore um, options sort of, I guess, like early and, but not trying, I wouldn't say commit to something early though. I would say explore things early and explore things often and explore the polar opposite. So you do, you know, a week of internal medicine or shadow an internist for a week, well then shadow an obstetrician for a week. Those are very different things. Um, and you might like them for different reasons or not like them for different reasons. I think the more you explore um, early and just like think about it, the easier that will be. Um, and maybe you'll just find there's so many things you like and you'll plot a lots of things and that's fine too. Anybody want to add anything? Um, I, I would just like to, oh, sorry, Cheyenne. Sorry, I just want to add just a bit of a, a different perspective, um, especially if you kind of know what specialty you want to go into and it's less competitive. As a pre-clerk, there's always the option of just not doing medicine and traveling and discovering yourself and doing other things because you're going to have a lot of experiences as a clerk and in electives and in residency. So before you get 
too deep into medicine, don't forget there's other things to do. Um, and enjoy your time, the more time off you have in pre clerkship as well. Sherry? Yeah, and the only other thing I was going to add is that um, in learner support services, we do provide you with the opportunity to connect with upper years and residents who are currently in that specialty. That can be absolutely valuable to hear from a resident who's doing their first or second year of residency in that specialty. They can provide you with so much guidance and support. Um, and that's really a, a valuable asset to all of you to be able to tap into those experiences. Are there any other comments or any questions, Alex? Uh, no, that is it. Um, I, I will continue to thank uh, Dr. Fournier, Dr. Plamondon, Dr. Purdy for such an amazing, you know, it's a little vulnerable eh, to tell your story and especially Dr. Turnbull for you to share your experience. It takes a lot of guts. Um, I can tell you that uh, my decision to choose family medicine was entirely based on my age. You know, I came into this at my third career and I knew I wasn't going to make it past two years of bucking authority. Uh, I needed to be able to, you know, get on and get out of the uh, the learning environment and get into practice. Um, so, you know, there are lots of reasons why people do what they do, but you guys shared great stories. Victoria, thank you so much for your knowledge and your wisdom. And I suspect that you're going to become the, uh, you know, counselor uh, of choice for everybody who goes unmatched. So um, I'm warning you right now. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Sherry and Jason, you guys are awesome. Everything in learner support services, learner affairs and undergrad medicine is so uh, really special for um, our university. And I do want you to, to mention that we've had our postgrad dean here uh, for most of this presentation. I think he's gone now. And our postgrad office, Joey McColeman, um, but Rob Anderson, our postgrad dean, has been here. Uh, we've had many faculty members as well. And I think the important thing to know, there you are, Joey, is that, hey, we have great residency programs. Okay, we have fantastic people who go into fantastic specialties. We're opening new residency programs over the next couple of years. And so if you have questions about Nazem University's uh, residency programs, yeah, urology is coming, obstetrics is coming with U of T. We've got uh, all kinds of really neat things happening. So, you know, we're growing. Uh, we're the most exciting medical university in Canada. Okay, we're the only medical university in Canada, but we're doing really well. Um, and of course, our organizers for today, uh, especially Rachel, Hallie, Jenna, and uh, Melissa, who were really fantastic in organizing this. This, this session is organized by uh, the... Um, uh, by the medical students. The topic is chosen by the medical students and they really did a great job organizing this. I see Rob Anderson is still here. Uh, so I want you all to know Rob Anderson, our Associate Dean Postgrad and Joy McColeman are uh, great sources of information. So don't hesitate to contact them. And of course, you know, everybody at Nazem U, we're rooting for you. We're on your side. This should not be a mystery. Hopefully we've dismissed, demystified it a bit and it should be fun. I agree with what Cheyenne said in the end. You got to have a life and have some fun and enjoy your life. And choosing your career should not be scary. It should be the best part of what happens to you in medicine. Uh, I love being a family doctor. Uh, and I, I think it's so much, so much, uh, joy in being able to be a fantastic doctor. And yes, I do want to put my plug in for Kaylin Purdy returning to Northern Ontario um, to be faculty in neurology, maybe program director someday. Uh, but uh, everyone's welcome to uh, look on the website. Uh, we have our comms people here who will uh, put this on the website as well as to approach our postgrad programs for any questions you have. So merci beaucoup, miigwech. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. We really um, want you to tell your friends, come to Nazem U. You'll have fun. Good night, everybody. Have a great evening. <laughs>